This is Jocko Podcast number 250 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. So on the last podcast, number 249, we were reading the newest edition of the book About Face by Colonel David Hackworth, which has a written uh, forward in it written by me. And if you haven't listened to 249 yet, just go back right now and listen to that one first. And we ended up re- reading some of the book, but we just started to scratch the surface. And, and look, I, I was prepping for this podcast and saying, you know what, we should read a little bit more. L- read a little bit more from the book, talk about it a little bit more. And just as things start to pick up in the Korean War, we just start to learn these incredible lessons. So we're gonna take one more look at About Face today. Picking up, it actually picks up do you know that when you write a book, they, they want you to have like the big action scene in the beginning? Well, I did not know that, but I, I understand. Right, right. So they want you know the, the reader to not you know to pick up the book and invest something into the book. So this book Makes starts sense. off with a big time action scene that we actually read last time. So this is a later chapter, but it actually predates the big action scene of February 6th, which is this battle where he gets wounded and he gets shot in the head. David Hackworth gets shot in the head and all this mayhem happens. So this is actually predates that with him kind of showing up in Korea. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk through some of these things. I'm going to try and slow it down and talk about some of the things that I pull out of this book. So here we go. Back to the book. The course of the Korean War had changed dramatically since its lightning fast beginning. At the start, U.S. forces, hopelessly outnumbered, outgunned, and undertrained, had been driven back by the North Koreans into the tiniest corner of South Korea beyond the Naktong River. There, the 8th Army dug in its heels, determinedly holding what was known as the Pusan perimeter until September when MacArthur's daring amphibious invasion at Incheon severed the North Korea. Korean army's lines of communications and chopped its legs out from under it. No longer was the enemy an effective fighting force and our certain defeat along the lines of Dunkirk in 1940 suddenly appeared to be surefire victory. Units of the 8th Army smashed out of Naktong perimeter. Spirits were high as we raced north beyond the 38th parallel, beyond the North Korean capital of Pyongyang to within spitting distance of the Yaolu River the dividing line between North Korea and Manchuria. Fighting was sporadic, but as units moved further north, the weather worsened and enemy resistance increased. It was like a com- it was like compressing a spring. The night the Chinese came, I was in a foxhole in the center of my scout section's defensive position. Now, let's think about that. The night the Chinese came. That's a scary thing. And You know, every time I read about the Korean War, which we've covered several Korean War memoirs on this podcast, what a what a savage scenario that was. And it's called the Forgotten War. And I did that piece. uh, I did a piece on Memorial Day and talked about the Forgotten War and and just about how anyone that was there. we could never forget what those guys went through in any way. And if you pay any attention to it whatsoever, you realize that we should always remember what sacrifices were made in the Korean War. And a lot of it, this sentence right here, the night the Chinese came. So here we go. The night the Chinese came, I was in a foxhole in the center of my scout section's defensive position. The sector was densely covered with screw pines and scrub oaks. My foxhole buddy and I were sitting on the edges of our hole when we saw, and it was like right out of a cartoon, a row of small trees moving toward us. We chopped them down along with a little Chinaman creeping along behind each one with hand grenades, but that was just the beginning. The next thing I saw was what I could only describe as a wave, a human wave of Chinese crashing over us. For the next three hours they came. Wall to wall Chinamen, many of whom did not even have rifles. Only long lances tipped with bayonets. Others were armed with US 
Thompson submachine guns or Russian drum-fed assault rifles. For the main, they were sorry shots with no understanding of basic infantry tactics. But what the Chinese lacked in proficiency, they made up for in numbers. And their presence heralded the start of the largest and most bitter retreat in U.S. Army history. So that's crazy, right? You've got these, these Chinese coming and they've got spears. Straight up. And can you imagine, imagine people coming at you for 10 minutes, right? Like, can you imagine enough people that they can come at you for 10 minutes? Yeah. Now imagine 30 minutes and you, that, imagine how many people that is. Mm. Now imagine three hours of people coming at you. <clears throat> Upon my arrival in Korea, I'd been assigned the 25th Recon Company as a replacement scout section leader. It was an army mistake. My military occupational specialty was infantry, not armored, recon, and it had, uh, had upset me to no end because 25th Recon guys were not eligible for the CIB regardless of how much infantry combat they saw. So the CIB is the Combat Infantryman Badge, and that's what you get when you're in direct combat in the army. And it's a, let's say that's like a serious mark of pride in the army because that means you've been in the shit. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see a little bit of ego creeping out from David Hackworth because he's like, what are you kidding me? We're just recon and we're, we are not even eligible for getting the CIB. Yeah. This is garbage. Continuing, add to that MacArthur's brilliant stroke at Inchon. The war had seemed over save for the victory parade. And I'd been sick that after all I'd gone through to get here, I'd missed the guts of the whole damn show. This is just, once again, this is typical, be careful what you wish for. He's thinking after Inchon, Americans had such a leg up that, ah, I missed it. I missed the war. I hadn't wanted to show up in another occupation force. So in the army, when he joined the army, he went to Europe. And World War II was over. And so he showed up there and he was just, you know, get you know standing around and starting standing guard duty and stuff like that they were training but whatever he wasn't getting the combat that he wanted mm -hmm. so he's afraid when he shows up in in korea oh they did this big move at Incheon. you were not going to get any combat mm -hmm. i hadn't wanted to end up in another occupation force still sergeant combat and that's the nickname that he earned himself even when there was no combat when he was in europe but he was just so fired up they called him Sergeant Combat. Mm. Only in a new theater, in my heart, I'd secretly wish the war would continue long enough to let me get involved in at least one good fight. My wish came true only too well. My first real firefight. And this is good, Teeth. It's always good to hear this, right? Because there's such a huge amount of difference between your first firefight and your next one. Just like, any, any, anything that we do, anything that you do as a human being, the learning curve when you see something for the first time is the steepest learning curve you're gonna get. Mm -hmm. So it's always good to think about these things. My first real firefight had occurred just before the Chinese came on a dull overcast day. The scout section had set up near a secondary road. We spotted a squad of North Korean soldiers, weapons at sling arms coming out of the tree line. They were good looking troops, but asleep at the switch. They didn't see us. It was an amazing sense of power I felt ultimate power, I suppose, just watching them come and holding that weapon in my hands. We let them get within about 30 yards before we cut loose. I dropped four guys point blank with my M1, each dead with a six o'clock sight picture in the chest, just like the good book said. I felt no guilt, few of us did. I'd been trained too well, and besides, the enemy had been utterly dehumanized throughout my training. They aren't men, they're just gooks, I thought. As the four enemy fell and a fierce firefight began, we'd knocked off the point element of a much larger enemy force and stirred up a hornet's nest. Okay, note on gooks, the term, and this is, this is in the book, it's, a, it's an asterisk, the term gook is derived from the Korean word han gook, which means Korean person. So I know that it's a insensitive term. It's in the book. What does six o'clock sight picture mean? Just where he's lining up his, his weapon, the sight on his weapon, mm. six o'clock sight picture, basically 
a point of aim, point of impact. So he's just aiming, um, I guess, like towards the bottom of his, he's, he's lining up the bottom of his sight on their chest. So he's simply saying like, I like made good shots yep. essentially, like yep. everything like lined good, up perfect. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And like the good book says, I'm sure he's referring to, you know, the army marksmanship yeah. manual, which says, you know, once you get this, you, you set the six o'clock of your sight onto the point of impact you want to hit. And I'm, I, I could be wrong about this cause I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but it's something meaning, Hey, he took the good solid sight picture that he's supposed to get right, right. the one that he was taught. Yeah. Boom. Hit him in the chest. But here's what sketchy is. These were just the point element. There are a bunch of people behind him. Following the lead of a lot of the older veterans earlier in the day, I'd placed several clips of ammo on my rifle sling. I liked the look. It was kind of John Wayne-ish. And it seemed to make sense, a new clip only seconds away. But when I'd taken up my prone firing position, the sling had flopped on the rain-soaked ground. Now, as the firefight got going, I grabbed for a clip only to discover that it and the rest of them were clogged with mud. Bullets were flying and my brain stalled out. I vaguely remembered an old tale about how well the M1 worked under any battlefield condition. Quickly knocking off the bigger pieces of muzz, Mud, I oozed the clip up into my rifle. I got one round off. The weapon jammed, and for the next few minutes, I sat in the ditch, field stripping, cleaning, and reassembling the thing while my first real combat went on without me. Our field, our, our artillery fire took the starch out of the North Korean advance, and we were able to scoot ass with no friendly casualties, other, that is, than Sergeant Combat's bruised pride. My first firefight had been my first screw up. I didn't know until much later that you generally don't walk away from that one. What does that say? Be prepared. So here he is in his first firefight. He's got the cool guy bandolier scenario going on <laughs> with, his we- with his weapon and his mags, and it doesn't work out well. That's why you gotta rehearse things, how they're gonna actually be. You can't just do something for the first time in combat and be like, oh, this will be fine. No. A few days later, five of us had been out on a reconnaissance patrol. It It was a very black night, save for the US flares that hung eerily over the battlefield. Very quiet, but for the occasional whine of artillery fire and the odd burst of an automatic weapon. We had moved about a mile into enemy territory when we heard motors. Leaving the patrol, I crawled to a mound near the edge of the road for a first hand look. Look, through the darkness, silhouetted by the artillery flares, I could see four enemy vehicles. A file of infantry was walking on each side of the motor column with more infantry walking in front. They were so close that I was sure the vehicle's engines prevented them from hearing my pounding heart. They passed by. I was about to return to the patrol when I saw a lone North Korean soldier, his weapon slung, tracing a telephone wire. As he passed my position, I parted his hair with a submachine gun magazine and dragged him back to the patrol. So he knocked this dude out. Think about that. Like a massive patrol goes by, you find one lone guy, take a magazine out of your gear, hit him on the head with it, knock him out, and then drag him back to your patrol. Daylight wasn't far off when we headed home. Progress was slow. Initially, we had to pack our zonked out prize. We, later he awoke, stumbled along belligerently, but at least under his own steam. When we thought we had made it, we ran into a large enemy force moving down the road in formation. They were jabbering excitedly and dragging machine guns behind them on squeaky wheels. We were about six yards from the road. I lay on top of the prisoner, covered his mouth with my hand, and pressed my trench knife hard against his throat. I thought the cold steel would be enough to convince him to be good, but it wasn't. Old habits die hard. He started squirming around. My hand was muffling his cries to his comrades. When he tried to bite it, I had no choice. I slit his throat and lay there on top of him for what seemed like a bloody eternity until the road was clear and we could hot foot it back to the US lines. There you go. Welcome to combat. I hadn't wanted to kill him. I would have rather to capture the guy. A live prisoner is worth a thousand dead hombres. 
but I was probably as scared as he was. And in a millionth of a second, I had to decide, and it was either him or my patrol. You know when people talk about the split seconds decisions you have to make in combat? Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna I'm gonna kill this guy. Killing that guy in one other incident probably hammered home most that Korea was not some training maneuver, that I was really in war, boots and all. The other occurred when we were digging in on a small knob overlooking a main north-south road. Digging in was a task of a frontline trooper performed at least once a day when on the move. Usually spent the time cursing your commander for always choosing the hardest ground in the town and then moving the line just when you'd finished your hole. Some of us thought it was an army plot to keep us in shape. For myself, I'd rather have done a million push-ups. But on this particular occasion, we'd gotten some great dirt. It was soft and loose, a breeze to dig. And I was about two feet down in no time. Then my shovel hit something mushy. A few quick scrapes revealed an olive drab green material. A few more uncovered a decaying corpse of a man with bright red hair and a 24th Division patch on his moldy, fatigued jacket. The soldier's hands had been tied behind him with communication wire and he'd been shot in the back of the head. Three more bodies were found by other troopers on our little knob, all killed and buried the same way company was notified. They said the men had probably been killed at the beginning of the war. That was when the 24th Division had fought along this road. We were instructed to dig out the dog tags and provide eight-digit grid coordinates where each body was found. The atrocity did little for morale, but a lot for fighting spirit. There would be no love lost for an enemy as savage as the North Korean Reds. So much for the Korean police action. I and my friends thought this was all out war with no quarter given. Yeah, he talked about dehumanizing the troops and I've talked about dehumanizing the enemy. And that is something that absolutely the military will try and do. And it's a very crazy fine line to walk because as you dehumanize the enemy, you're also possibly dehumanizing the civilians that are in that area. And so you have a very sketchy scenario that can unfold, but they still have to do it to some level because otherwise you've got people, the U.S. military, that in their mind, you know, it's a sin to kill or whatever beliefs they have. They don't want to do it. And you're trying to convince them that it's okay because these aren't even people. Mm -hmm. They're not even humans, that's dehumanizing. And I've said before, and this is the type of thing that makes it very clear, you know, I've said that the, we didn't really, in, in Iraq, we didn't really have to dehumanize the enemy because the enemy dehumanized themselves with the things that they did to the local populace, torture, murder, rape, just complete and utter savagery. And that's the same thing that's happening right here. You know, you're finding Americans that have been bound and sh- executed in the back of the head and buried in shallow graves. Continuing on, now that the Chinese were in the conflict, the recon company's mission was to provide a reconnaissance screen in front of the 25th Infantry Division's withdrawal. In other words, to delay, deceive, and disorganize the undeniable communist advance. So the Chinese are coming now. They've got the numbers, they've got the masses, they've got America on its heels. Get the 25th ID, Tropic Lightning, by the way. Stationed in Hawaii. I went out and I went out and spoke, had the honor of speaking to the 25th ID, just a historic group of soldiers. The Chinese had struck the 8th Army like a giant steamroller, crushing many units and mauling most others. 8th Army's commander, Lieutenant General Walton Walker, who had said in July of 1950, as the first real southward began, quote, there will be no Dunkirk, there will be no Bataan. A retreat to Pusan would be the greatest butcheries in history. We must fight until the end. 
end quote. Now found himself directing yet another brave but bloody withdrawal to the south. Only seven years before, General Eisenhower's forces were similarly surprised and smashed. But that time, we'd had Patton to save the day. In my heart of hearts, I kind of wished someone would get the idea to use our recon company to be the spearhead to Bastogne for the Korean conflict. But it was not to be in just as well. Unlike the 752nd Recon, which had 17 M24 light tanks, we were a light-skinned force with only six M24s in the whole company. Divide these up amongst three identical platoons, and it wasn't exactly the punch Lieutenant Colonel Creighton Abrams had in 1944. Still, we had plenty to do to keep us occupied. Exchanging ground for time, the drill went that we would hold a position until the enemy was breathing hot and heavy down our necks and we would break contact and run like hell. Leapfrogging through another recon platoon or rifle unit that was set up behind us in the same way. So they're doing a cover and move as they're retreating. Trading ground for time. It was a dangerous game with no room for error and we found ourselves playing it day after day after day. They were strange dudes, the Chinese seemingly with no sense of personal peril. That's a bold statement. Seemingly with no sense of personal peril. That's a human instinct Mm. of self-preservation and they didn't seem to have it. Mm. You know, when, uh, when Seth Stone went into Sodder City, you know, that was in 2008, we had fought in Ramadi in 2006 and he, I was talking to him while he was there, you know, after the first couple operations that they ran and he said something similar. I don't remember the exact quote of what he said, but what he was trying to explain to me was the fighters in Ramadi were perhaps better fighters, more tactically skilled, he said, but he's like, these guys in Sadr City, they don't care. They don't care if they die, and they are just coming. And it's a different type of threat. Yeah. Right? It's a different scenario that you're under. Yeah. <clears throat> It was not unusual to see them jump on a U.S. tank, holding grenades, and then scramble around looking for some opening to toss them in. Of course, if the tank was buttoned up, it was impossible, and the tank commander inside would simply call another tank nearby to, quote, scratch my back, which, at which point the second tank would spray the first tank with 30 caliber coaxial machine gun fire and wash the hitchhikers off. But there were always other Chinamen to take the dead ones' places, It was a grim fact and we were constantly reminded of as we were moving south. Morale dropped with every rearward step of the humiliating retreat. That is just important to remember that when things aren't going right, when you're in a leadership position and things aren't going right and you have to retreat or you have to take a tactical withdrawal or you have to undo some of the progress that you've made or you have to abandon some of the work that you've done, which this, 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 I'm not just talking about war, I'm talking about any scenario, business, life. You've got, when you have to retreat, you have to pay attention to the morale of the troops because it sucks. Mm. It sucks and what it sucks is it sucks the morale right away from the troops. They've put forth this effort, they fought and bled or they've worked really hard to get to a certain point and now you're leaving. We kept falling back away from the Yalu beyond Pyongyang until we'd refocused the 38th parallel and we were back in South Korea. The only thing I think running faster than the 8th armor were the rumors. The Marines were cut off at a place called the Chosen Reservoir in the north and were being zeroed out. The U.S. Army 10 Corps had surrendered. Boats were waiting at Pusan Harbor to take us to Japan. These are all just crazy rumors that are going around, partially true, partially untrue. Maybe. Meanwhile, while inner winter had arrived, but winter gear had not, MacArthur had said we'd be home before Christmas. I guess his supply people believed him because the Chinese had caught us with our pants down and they were summer trousers. Feet and leather boots froze. Gloves and mittens were scarce as good-looking girls. Our field jackets were as thin as, and protective as page one of the newspaper. We were slowly freezing to death in the bitter below zero weather while the Chinese, like Genghis Khan's mighty hordes, marched on seemingly unstoppable. 
logistics wins wars and here you are it's crazy to think about this uh, compared to either Napoleon's march into Russia which we've covered on this podcast with the memories of a Napoleonic foot soldier and how everyone oh we will be we, we don't need winter stuff we should be done by winter mm-hmm. and then same thing with the Nazis going into Russia in Stalingrad freezing how come we don't learn these lessons? How come? The, you know, this has something to do with I was talking about the other day. When you come up with a freaking plan, you need to have a negative attitude. You need to have a negative attitude. Your attitude can't be, we're gonna be home by Christmas. Yeah. That's just wrong. Your attitude has to be, this could take five years or more. We need to be ready for the worst case scenario. Going in there and thinking we'll be home by Christmas, like let's if that if 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 MacArthur uttered that one time, which he did, think of the effect and impact that has on the rest of the chain of command. Think of the impact that that has on the whole supply logistics chain. Mm. When they go, oh, you know, it's going to be over by Christmas. I guess it's not really that important that we get good boots for the men. Mm. I guess it's really not that important that we get good warm jackets for the men yeah just just a little hint of that yeah i feel like i kind of fall into that trap a lot of times you know when you go in somewhere and, and you know what that is that is a an extreme form of decentralized command it's an extreme form of commander's intent right what so 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 lately i've been talking about the fact that culture is Culture is like the most premier, highest form of decentralized command and commander's intent. Because if the, our culture is, for instance, hey, we always take care of the customer, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Then you, Echo Charles, as a frontline guy working at a cash register, you can make yeah. a decision on what to do with a customer because you know that our customer is the most important thing. Yeah. If you know that, listen, we always we always treat civilians with the utmost respect. That's our culture. When you get into a situation where there's a wounded, you know, a wounded mom in a house with a building, you make that a priority and you take care of them and you get medevac and, and, and casualty care for that individual, right? Because that's our culture. Mm-hmm. So culture is a, like the highest form of decentralized command. Mm-hmm. Well, what happens when you give commander's intent just by saying something is innocent as will be home by Christmas. Think of how that rever- reverberates throughout the, the organization. Everybody goes, ah, we're good. Because mm. can you think about the Herculean efforts that it takes to, to get you know 200,000 warm jackets and pairs of boots in specific sizes? That, that, that's no, no joke. Mm. You can't just snap your fingers and that happens. It's gonna take effort. It's gonna take effort at every level. People stepping up to make things happen. Mm. You know, like in a communist country, when, when I remember when the Polish were kind of uh, striking against the against the the communist regime there, they would just make little small mistakes in factories. Right? You can prevent things from happening by just doing a little bit, just by just dragging your feet just a little bit. Because Echo, if you drag your feet just a little bit, hey, maybe it's not that big of a deal. But if there's a hundred people. And you're all dragging your feet. We're not making progress anymore. Mm. So you picture an entire supply chain that hears, "Eh, it'll be over by Christmas." How much effort's put, being put forth? Well, you know, best. sure. Do you have some really great people in there somewhere that are going to get after it? Yeah, you do. Does that overcome the other ninety-four percent of the people that are dragging their feet, and it's not that big of a deal? And hey, I'm going to he- still head home at four o'clock today. Yeah. 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 The jacket thing. But you know how like when you go somewhere, I don't know, to the park, the carnival, mm-hmm. whatever, and you, you kind of don't account for the weather or, you know, like when the sun goes down. No, or, you do or, account for the weather. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I know where you're going know. with this. Yeah, like to me, the weather is I look outside and boom, there's That's your that. weather. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But meanwhile, my wife is like, oh, bring the jacket, bring the water just in case they get thirsty mm-hmm. and you get there, you know, whatever, all this stuff. She's bringing these bags. I was like, bro, I don't need bags. You know, I don't need all this stuff. I'm mm-hmm. going to the park. All I need is me, really. And so does she let you learn your lesson each and every time? Yeah, pretty much, mm-hmm. yeah. You go there. And the, here's the thing that, in I mean, in my particular case, which, you know, maybe this 
applies to others as well where I won't learn the lesson every single time because sometimes I'm like fine. Yeah. You know, sometimes I do make it home. You before reinforce Christmas. you yeah. reinforce the lesson of being a slacker. Yes, exactly right. So You're but right. this is not an easy lesson to learn. Okay, so you we live mm-hmm. collectively, you and I at this time we live in San Diego, California. And what's interesting about San Diego, California mm-hmm. is if you go out to dinner, let's say right now, what is it? Yeah. October twenty twenty. If you go out for dinner at six o'clock at night, the sun is still up and it's it's warm outside. It's yeah. 80 degrees. Yeah. There's no need for, a jacket isn't even conceivable. Right. But if you're gonna eat outside and the sun's gonna go down, yep. it is going to get chilly. Oh, yeah. It's gonna get chilly, it's gonna get 50 degrees. Yeah. That's gonna happen in you know three, four hours. Yeah. So yes, when you yeah, when you're used to that scenario being the case, it like gets easier or whatever. But man, yeah, it, it does kind of take this weird mindset. I had that exact scenario happen, by the way, like the like a week ago, whatever. My wife's birthday. We go to this re- It's called like sea level. I don't know. One of these. Mm-hmm. You know, the I've restaurant. been there. Yeah, no, actually, uh, yes. Some of the guys there said that you been there before <laughs> at the restaurant so i was like all right cool um but, but yes. one of our people works there yeah yeah one of our jujitsu people works oh yeah, there. yeah yeah fully um so yeah so i go there uh, so we go and you know it's warm it's kind of hot it's been hot mm-hmm. so i'm like all right same tactics right look outside what's the weather like oh we're sitting outside cool i look outside weather hot sunny whatever cool <laughs> And here's the thing, my <laughs> wife kind of felt, she didn't fall for it, but she kind of was like, kind of was feeling the same mm-hmm. thing. So I was like, whatever. No jackets, didn't bring jackets for the kids, nothing like that. So we go in there and our seats are, yes, outside, but covered. It's a little bit of an ocean breeze going mm-hmm. through there. And here's the thing, it wasn't cold. I wouldn't call it cold, but it was something. <laughs> like you had like chicken skin every maybe, once in a while. Maybe you, you know? wanted that lightweight hoodie. Lightweight hoodie would have been perfect. Mm. Would have been perfect. Mm. And here's the thing is it wasn't about me. It was about the kids, yeah. everybody else. You get you try to get a four year old and a seven year old that's just slightly uncomfortable and chilly. They might not throw a tantrum, but you're gonna hear about it. You can learn this lesson. It's a good lesson and you seem to have to learn it over and over again. Some of my kids know it. Yeah. They think, you know, they're bringing. I was gonna meet my meet my family like I, I think we were recording one day and I was gonna meet my family somewhere eating outside yeah. COVID you got to eat outside and whatnot oh, right yeah. so but my son actually just showed up with a sweatshirt for me credit oh, right man. full yep. credit yep. Full. gets full credit on that one yeah because that's like and really the whole reason is like bro why, why do I want to why am I gonna wear myself down carrying this jacket when I probably won't need it. Why am I going to carry this, you know, bag of additional clothing when we're not going to need all this stuff? Why this big bottle of water, you know? Bro, there's water there. You know, like, bro, why are you (laughs) bringing all this stuff? Like, stop loading, like, you know. Anyway, so, yeah, but, again, like, you have that mindset, you're going to get jammed up or potentially get yeah. jammed up in the, you know, in the future. you got to plan for that kind of stuff, which I think my wife is, like, that's her whole jam. It's like, what do we need? Well, she'll overdo it, you know? Yeah. But I'll underdo it. I think, like, the answer, the solution is right there in the middle. I hope you guys can find a balance. Re- responsibly <laughs> evaluate future scenarios. Yes. They were not only short on cold weather gear, continuing on back to the book, food was in short supply. All spare time was spent scrounging. One of the most modern armies in the world became an army of days past, foraging and living off the land. We kicked in the walls of houses, searching for rice and kimchi, hidden in false walls and secret caches. We cooked what we found in our steel pots. When nothing else was available, we'd take the sea ration packets of sugar, powdered coffee, powdered milk, and chocolate we'd stored for days like squirrels in the pockets of our fatigues, mash it all together with snow on our helmets and trick trick ourselves into believing it was ice cream. 
Trying to beat the elements became a war in itself. It was so bitterly cold you couldn't sleep. You had to keep moving, stomping feet, and flexing fingers 24 hours a day. Those who didn't were saying goodbye to their hands and feet, and in some cases their lives. For a while every day, a couple men were evacuated because of frostbite. Black toes and fingers to be cut off at the hospital. Grenades, knives, and ammo would freeze fast to the foxhole brim. Weapons froze too. You'd have to kick the bolts of the M1 and brown automatic rifles to get them back we seldom had rifle patches to clean our weapons most of us cut little squares out of our shirts or trousers to do the best we could gun oil was a luxury usually beyond our reach we lubricated our weapons with motor oil or the frozen lard of sea rations and took to keeping them with us in our fart sacks at night staying alive became our only concern and we did Man is most adaptable. When we passed through villages, if a house had a lot of wood, doors, window frame, even the most beautiful hand-carved furniture, we'd burn it one piece at a time, finishing off the job by throwing a thermite grenade on the thatch roof and standing by until the whole structure was burned to the ground. Our orders were to destroy anything the enemy could use. Gladly, we thought to ourselves, and we could stay warm while we did it. At night, we would carefully, obsessively bundle, stack, and restack kindling wood while waiting for daybreak when we could light our fires. The thought of those friendly flames allowed us to make it through the night. Instantaneously, at first light, thousands of tiny fires would spring up across the front and around each huddled a cluster of shivering men. It was probably as bad in the Chinese camp, except that at least the chinks were prepared with winter gear, down trousers and jackets, long overcoats that blended in with the snow, and down mittens that we liberated and wore until our own supply people came through. It was a frigid, brutal, soul-destroying time. I knew then how the Wehrmacht. I knew then how the Wehrmacht must have felt during World War II, or how Napoleon's army must have suffered years and years before that, when each made their horrible winter retreat from Russia. Like I said, this just is savage, frigid, brutal, soul-destroying time. And this is coming from the perspective of a guy that, you know, served multiple combat t- tours in Vietnam as well. By the time we reached Seoul, the North Korean capital, once a bustling city of mil- millions, was virtually deserted, an empty gray tomb. Most of its inhabitants and those in the, of the northern villages on its outskirts had left and headed south with the few possessions they could carry, clogging the roads with wall-to-wall human misery. On one occasion, American fighter planes must have concluded that the hordes of desperate civilians were Chinese columns moving south. P-51s had strafed the refugees, and for at least a mile there were dead littered across the road. Retreating vehicles had to push the bodies out of the way. It was here that I realized it was only the guys on the ground who saw and understood the real horrors of war. To Air Force pilots, war is a remote thing. They make their kills from hundreds or thousands of feet in the air. Even the guys who fly on the deck do so in a flash, dropping their loads and flying away without seeing the results, the way homes and people are blown to smithereens or the effects of napalm. At night, they don't, didn't have to listen, as we did in the winter of 1950, to the wail of the gooks, cries of civilian refugees begging to be let through American lines, or see in the morning when they were allowed to pass through the dead they'd left behind, those who'd frozen to death in open rice paddies overnight. The pilot, when he finishes his day's work, flies back to his base, lands, goes to the club, has a big steak, and if he wants to forget the day's combat, he can drink himself into a stupor. The frontline fighter can't do that. He lives with death and the horror of the battlefield every day and every night. It is his cross to bear. We continued retreating. Gray, rotting bodies, the unforgettable smell of death, rats feasting on the dead and growing bolder by the day. This, 
the flotsam and jetsam of war led us through Seoul. Our unit's mission was to fight a rear guard action in the center of the city. The scout section rifle squad set up at a downtown intersection. We took over a bank, a drugstore, and two other corner buildings. For my command post, I'd use the bank's manager's plush office, which was a welcome diversion from the cold and snow. The bank vault was locked tight. As the self-appointed new bank manager, I authorized the guys to open it with their 3.5 anti-tank bazooka. Two rounds later, the door swung open as easy as a sea ration can in the hands of a hungry trooper. The vault contained thousands of dollars in small Korean notes. All the big stuff was gone. I told everyone to cash in. No withdrawal, no withdrawal forms needed, I said, and they did. We had to laugh at the propaganda leaflets that the Chinese mortared down upon us from the hills they occupied on the high ground around Seoul. Quote, American capitalists, running dogs of Wall Street, they accused. How right they are, I thought, as we stuffed our pockets in packs and even made hobo sacks to carry our spoils of war. It was strange watching the Chinese brazenly looking down from those hills about six or 800 yards away. Our infantry weapons were out of range, preventing a little selective sniping, but we were able to put some effective fire on them with the M24's main gun and had the great fun of taking pot shots with the turrets 50 cal. The Chinese went to ground and shy of a cheerless Christmas, we slipped out of the sad, near deserted Seoul. My section's newfound wealth was the first thing to be tossed on the side of the road. Bulky dollars meant nothing, meant little to worn out troopers, and it had been just a game anyway. South of Seoul, we found ourselves caught in a friendly battle zone. A railway yard being blasted to kingdom come by demolition toting engineers and Air Force bombers. Railroad flat cars complete with brand new vehicles and tanks, which would have been distributed to the front lines had it not collapsed, were being blown sky high to keep them out of enemy lines. To us in the middle, the challenge of this army obstacle course was not only to avoid our own flying debris, but also the enemy incoming, which was pouring in throughout the operation. Yeah, that's that's a scary sight. So you've got, and it shows you the. I guess it shows not scary. It's the desperation of the situation that you're in. That you've got however many numbers of vehicles that were going to be shipped up to the front time, and now we're just blowing them in place so that the enemy doesn't capture them. You want to talk about a morale a morale crusher? We came upon the number of freight cars with sealed doors. One of the guys pried one open to reveal an entire carload of PX supplies, soap, cigarette, aftershave lotion, obviously goodies needed by our rear echelon comrades. And we decided to help ourselves. Someone drove a brand new three quarter ton truck off a nearby flat car, so we had a way to get away with had a way to get to carry out our loot. It fell about four feet and crashed to the ground, springs breaking, fenders collapsing, but it still ran. That's a comic scene, right? You got this vehicle on a flat pit, on a flat uh, freight train and just drive it off Dukes of Hazard style. <laughs> we loaded our spoils onto the truck even as telephone poles and large chunks of steel rained down around us. Then we jumped aboard ourselves and unasked the place, eight recon men bouncing along in a light in a, in a truck right out of the grapes of wrath. We motored by a battalion of infantry hiking south down the road. Hey, how are you fixed for cigarettes, we called. And aqua velva, anyone? As we threw all the troopers a little something. We ran out of goodies about the same time. Our mobile pack PX ran out of gas and we reluctantly turned to the, returned to the backs of our tanks with the rest of our platoon. We were young. Sometimes the war was great fun, like a game of cops and robbers or cowboy and Indians that you played as kids. You know, it's from a maturity level, right? That's something that's just so, it's important to remember, man, that you're dealing with people that are 19, 20 years old, 21 years old. I mean, Hackworth's one of the older guys. Mm -hmm. But most of these guys, a lot of these guys, when you go into the military, it's young kids. When I went in, I was 18 years old. Like, 
I'm a, you know, my judgment, uh, you know, when you talk about the, what is it, the development of the prefrontal cortex, right? Yes, yes, which, as a, which as a man mm-hmm. doesn't develop until you're something like 25. Yes, sir. So you gotta, you gotta find your way through seven years of military service where your freaking decision making process is not yeah. fully developed yet. Yeah. That's how dumb shit happens. Yeah, makes sense. You do dumb shit. That's why leadership is so important in the military. But the thing is, sometimes the military leaders are only 23. They're still not even there yet. (laughs) Continuing on, the politics or purpose of the war was not our concern. We didn't understand or care about the big picture any more than we really understood the risks of combat of being killed or going home without a leg. After a while, you stop worrying if the next minute you were going to get it. Instead, you just prayed for a clean wound so you could get out of there. A million dollar wound to get you home. You know what was crazy? When we had Dean Ladd on, Mm. and he was going into Tarawa, where the Japanese had a freaking island fortress. And I asked him, I was like, were you worried about getting wounded or anything? And he's like, no, that would be someone else. (laughs) (laughs) That's the deal, man. It's not gonna happen to me. After we uh, retreated across the Han River, my platoon was given the mission to outpost a long, lonely stretch of the South Bank. It was Christmas Day, and although there were no Chinese in sight, it wasn't a particularly jolly time. General Walker had been killed two days before in a freak Jeep truck accident very similar to the one that had killed his former World War II boss, General Patton. Still, paratroop general Matt Ridgway had taken over as the new commander of the 8th Army and word was we would retreat no further. It was a good word, but my platoon had a more immediate concern. We were starving. A personal recon of the area revealed a village nearby whose only occupants were a half a dozen scroungy looking chickens. One long burst from my borrowed M2 carbine gave us Christmas dinner in the form of three decisively dead birds that we plucked and threw on an open fire. We ate them unseasoned and undercooked. They were very, very raw, in fact, but wonderful to us. And we gobbled them down and huddled closer to the fire thinking how lucky we were. No sooner had we finished than a recon company jeep and trailer bounced across the field to our positions. Christmas dinner, turkey, cranberry sauce, and all the trimmings had arrived. Only the American army could do that. Unfortunately, our chicken appetizer had left all of us with roaring gut aches. But we wolfed it down anyways because it was good, because it was there, and because none of us knew if this meal would be the last. The enemy took soul just after the new year. The bridge across the Han had been blown, but a few days later the chinks got a bridgehead across and we once again headed south in zero degree weather with our tails between our legs. So much for no more retreats. I began to think about all the general's proclamations concerning this war that we'd be home before Christmas, that the Chinese would not intervene, that we'd hold here, we'd hold there. All of it was bullshit. And I started to wonder how they could possibly make so many dumb statements when each invariably fell apart when put to the test. Then I thought, well, maybe they just don't know. We never saw a general on the front. We seldom saw a colonel, a lieutenant colonel, or a major either. And at the squad level, we only on the rarest occasion saw a captain. So how could the brass know how defeated its army was if it wasn't there to see, or if they weren't there to see an exhausted guy lie down on a road and just give up? How could they know how cold and ill-equipped we were if they weren't there to see blue, gloveless hands stick to the frozen metal of weapons? How could they know how steep and rugged the terrain was if they never climbed a hill? Little leadership lesson there, massive leadership lesson there. You have to find out what's going on with the frontline troops. And you can't rely on reports. And you know, I was reading some other sections of this book and and the 
temptation to just listen to the reports of frontline troops in any organization is a it's a massive temptation and it's the wrong thing to do. Mm. Because of course, when you're in charge, of course your subordinates are gonna polish that thing up for you. Mm. Make it look all good. Make it look all good. That's what they're gonna do. You can't rely on that. You have to go down there. And the other thing you have to do is you have to be able to admit when you don't know something. So the front, when you say the frontline troops, like they'll polish like their report. Yeah, That's absolutely. Like, why do they do that? Just to to show like, hey, we're doing a good job down here, kind of thing, or or they don't want to get anyone in trouble, or like what would uh, be the to not to go super philosophically deep on you right now, but a lack of moral courage. Gotcha. A lack of moral courage to report to your boss, my men are frozen, starving, and they're ready to give up. Because yeah. what you're doing is, you're, you look, you're the leader. And so you're putting yourself on report for not being a good leader. Yeah. Right? Because, yeah. you know, it, there's no bad teams, only bad leaders. All right. Oh, like the leader of the front line so, guys. Yeah, so if I'm a leader yeah. on the front, if you're General Echo, mm-hmm. and and my guys haven't eaten, and their 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 morale is breaking, I don't want to tell you that because then you'll be like, well, what's wrong with you, Jocko? Right, right. What, what, how come? Because guess what, Fred over there, he's like, my men are doing great, right? Because right. he has no moral courage to actually tell the truth about what's happening. Yeah, yeah. And 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 then that that puts pressure on me. Where now I'm thinking, uh oh, I mean, Fred's doing well. Maybe my guys. Maybe my guys can do better. And uh, okay, you know what, General Echo, uh, we're fine. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So it's a lack of moral courage. Yeah, it seems natural too now. Now that I'm kind of thinking of it like that, especially yeah, if you're in charge of the guys over there, you don't want to, <laughs> you don't be like, yeah, we're uh, we're not doing good. Yeah, right? even like it kind of seems like even in like social scenarios, you oh, know, for we'll sure. do that. Like we're like, hey, so how's uh, how's married life or so? I don't know, whatever, yeah. whatever the situation is, and you don't want to be like, <laughs> I'm struggling through this married life kind of thing. Like it's like you don't want to say that if in fact you're struggling through married mm-hmm. life. I'm just saying, yeah, it seems like. Yeah, that seems a lot more natural now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, and I mean, obviously it happened in the business world too because, you know, the oh, ha, ha, Echo, how's your sales going with your sales team down there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you don't want to say, well, it's not going very well because yeah, you're putting yourself on report for, for, for failing because yeah. you are the leader. Yeah. But if there's stuff, what you should say, what you should say is, hey, boss, here's what's going on. My troops, they're over fatigued right now. We need food and we need some warm weather gear. Because look, there's some there's some motivate there's some motivated guys that want to make it happen, but when they can't even load their weapon because their skin is freezing to the bullets, that is a problem, a problem that no amount of motivation can cure. We need gloves, like that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. You have to be able to frame it correctly. Yeah. Back to the book. Still, we kept retreating, exchanging ground for time. We were always cold, always hungry, always tired. We were also filthy. It was too cold to even consider washing. So when we got to Suwon and found ourselves with a few days to rest, we decided to take that abandoned city by storm. As in Seoul, everyone had left Suwon in a great hurry so we could pretty well help us help ourselves to whatever we needed. My section took over a house. We scrounged around and found an old-fashioned Korean bath. One of those stand-up jobs about chest high with a wood furnace beneath it. We filled the tub, built a roaring fire, and one by one jumped in, each of us skimming the other guy's dirt off the top of the water. I was last. The water was almost black by then with all kinds of crud floating around, but I didn't care. I might not have gotten clean, but for the first time in weeks, I was warm. Just after we left Suwon, my platoon was ordered to establish a night blocking position astride a north-south road that paralleled a railroad track. The scout section and rifle squad were set up on, in a defensive line that ran from the road through a rice paddy and onto a railroad trestle. Our machine gun was set up on the trestle pointing straight down the tracks. A little high ground where it could put plunging fire directly in front of deployed troops and flanking fire on the road 50 yards away. Our platoon leader stayed with the two M24 tanks on the road. Behind him was the 81 millimeter mortar squad. It was late at night, all was quiet. We were locked and cocked 
and pros at this deadly delaying game now. I moved between positions, having whispered conversations with the guys. It was a habit I had to keep myself awake and make sure the men stayed awake too. I was the... I was at the machine gun, which was manned by a stud of a Hawaiian trooper named Sheldon when we saw the enemy coming. There was at least a company and maybe more behind, four abreast, double timing quietly down the railroad track. When they were no more than 30 yards from the machine gun, Sheldon let loose a long burst that cut a wide swath into their unsuspecting ranks. A burst of machine gun fire was the signal for the infantry, tanks, and mortars to join the fray. The scout section and rifle squad immediately poured fire into the enemy formation. The enemy panicked. They did not fire one round and return. Instead, they broke ranks and hightailed it to the rice paddy, running right into the rifle squad's grazing fire. It was great to see. We were cleaning the clock of an enemy force at least 10 times our size, like young Rommel did, I thought, in 1914, when he ambushed and destroyed almost a complete British rifle company with a handful of soldiers simply by using initiative and surprise, two of the key elements in battle. The mortar was plopping rounds of high explosives right on top of the confused reds. Meanwhile, our tank's main guns, which were loaded with anti-personnel grape shot, hadn't fired anything at all. A white star cluster flare popped and hovered over our positions. This was our signal to beat feet in retreat, and we didn't need a second invitation. We scrambled to waiting vehicles and quickly moved to and through U.S. lines. We'd taken no casualties, but I still couldn't understand why the tank's guns hadn't fired. The enemy had been hurt badly, but not destroyed. If those tank guns had been employed, we'd have completely wiped them out. The sun was coming up as the platoon pulled into the abandoned Chonin schoolyard that served as the base for recon company. I went over to our platoon sergeant at, and asked him why the tanks hadn't been used. He looked away and sort of bowed his head as if he was embarrassed, which was very strange behavior for this rugged, highly decorated warrior. Better see the lieutenant, young sergeant. Why didn't the tanks fire? I asked my regular army platoon leader moments later. I didn't want to give our positions away, he replied. I couldn't believe it. Give your positions away? Bullshit, I cried. Sergeants didn't talk to officers like that, but I didn't care. We had the closest thing to a glorious victory that I'd seen the chinks stuck their noses into this goddamn war, that I'd seen since the chinks stuck their noses into this goddamn war, and now this pissant weak lieutenant, you were just too yellow to do your job, I shouted, and stormed back into my scout section in a, in a rage. I grabbed my pack and rifle. I'm leaving this outfit right now, I told my platoon sergeant. I'm not waiting for orders. I'm going AWOL. I came here to fight, not play hide and seek. And where I come from, officers like you've got here would have been drummed right out of the officer's corps. And with that, I headed for the road. <laughs> so that's just mayhem, right? Mm. They, they, they don't actively assault the enemy with all the firepower that they had. Hackworth gets pissed off, so he goes AWOL. Now normally, absent without leave, what someone's trying to do is they're trying to shirk responsibility. You know, they're a hippie or they're a bum and they're trying to get out of there. They're, they're for whatever reason, they're trying to leave. They're trying to get away from the army. Yeah. He's going AWOL because he wants to fight more. <laughs> there was a uh, expression in there mm -hmm. and i've heard it before uh their ranks like he referred to like we shot bullets into their ranks and then they broke rank yeah. right like what assembled I, I, I in a formation type thing okay. like lined up yeah which is crazy to think about it's crazy to think about in modern war a group of individuals being in ranks mm -hmm. so in ranks is like you know four across and whatever 30 deep that's in a, ranks it's a specific formation assemblance or is it just yeah. sort of just them over there in that whatever assemblance? I mean the fact that he's saying in ranks yeah. means that they're in a legitimate formation yeah you know they're probably moving down this road they don't think there's any Americans there to interfere with them so they're yeah. just in ranks walking because it's an efficient way to walk yeah but so it's not an efficient way to fight mm, yeah it doesn't seem like it would it's be. an efficient way to get mowed down by machine gun which is exactly <laughs> what happened 
<laughs> yes. Yeah, I could see that. Well, yeah, and so when they broke ranks, they all ran in different directions. Yeah. You know. So, well, let me ask you this first, just in the spirit of understanding what that means, because it sounds mm-hmm. real cool, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Like I could just be throwing out that expression <laughs> from time to time, not in a military sense, but you know, I don't know. I don't know. Well, in they do use it in a non-military sense. Let's say. There's 20 people and we're uh, we come up with a plan and we're gonna go forward with this new plan And then echo decides he's gonna do something different. There's yeah. an expression. Oh echo just broke ranks Okay, yes, exactly right and that's kind of what I was sort of trying to figure out mm-hmm. like could I use it in that way? Yes, you can because it sounds really cool when you're, instead of like oh, yeah I just started shooting at all of them, <laughs> you know I Shot into their ranks, you know, like that sounds way cooler but so could it be even loosely used in in an official on an official situation um, of just a group of people there, you know. Yeah, right. Like they weren't little bit. necessarily in a specific formation, but they were over there deliberately. Yeah, I, I would say know? that was a bunch of people. Yeah, I would say that was a crowd of people. Right, right. That's if what you I'm say. There's a a bunch of people in ranks. Yeah, they're organized. Yeah. Well, could they be interpreted as organized? You know, like, uh, you know, the kind where those two guys, let's say not military, maybe like, I don't know, your friends in the neighborhood Mm -hmm. and you don't like them, you know, Mm -hmm. a bunch of cousins or whatever. You Mm -hmm. don't like them. (laughs) And they're over there on the corner. Right. And you have maybe you and your brother, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. You guys don't like them. They don't like you. Whatever. And then you see them over there on the corner assembled, not for any specific reason, but they're together, you know. Could you, could you, in theory, refer to them as the, on the corner in ranks? In theory, yes, you could, but it wouldn't be accurate. Two people is not going to equivalent. <laughs> no, the cousins, gonna, let's say there was five, five cousins. Even five, you're, it's going to have a hard time getting, you know, being in ranks no, with no, five people. Nope, to me, they're in ranks. I'm, so I'm you're going, asking I'm me for permission forward. to use this word, and then you're just, when I tell you no, yep. you're just doing it anyways? Yes, sir. Cool. Say whatever you want to say. Right. It's your, you're the one that's going to look. You're the one that's going to look dumb. It, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't want to say it, but like, yeah, well, this is where we're at. Yeah, you sounded like you really did want to say it. But if look, I hesitated, if, 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 if those, I paused. If those is five this the right thing to do? If, call my friend dumb? Well, I guess it is. Apparently. My friend wants to act dumb. He's going to get called dumb. <laughs> anyway. You can't just decide what you're going to call something. Look, if there's five there's cousins definitions. on the corner all together cruising and me and my brother start running at them aggressively and they scatter, they broke ranks. Okay, I'll 100%. give you that. There you go. So then now I guess I'm dumb because they You're not would dumb. have had to been in some form of ranks. Yeah, so I, I, just, I, I look at this as like an understanding process. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Do you understand? Yes, sir, I do. Thank you. I'm not even sure I understand anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so Hackworth goes AWOL because he wants to fight more. Back to the book. Any man who's wild enough to go AWOL to fight is just the kind of man we want in our outfit, said Captain John Paul Van when I stopped at his 8th Ranger camp fresh from my breakfast out of the 25th Recon Company. The 8th Rangers was a great spirited outfit, recently rebuilt after being decimated the night the Chinese entered the war. After I'd explained my situation, the whole outfit accepted me with open arms. The Rangers were elite troops, forerunners of the Special Forces. Their mission was raids, long reconnaissance patrols, ambushes, and other special jobs that conventional troops were not trained to handle. Their history went back to Rogers Rangers before the Revolutionary War. During World War II, there had been six Ranger battalions whose brave and daring feats are unmatched to this day. Historically, such all volunteers, specially trained units, had been misused tasked either with impossible missions for organizations their size or placed with palace guard combat duties well beneath their skill and ability. When I arrived at the 8th Ranger camp, the unit was chasing guerrillas behind the main lines. Morale was high and the guys were spoiling for a good fight, but during the time I was there, there was nothing much, to my way of thinking anyway, that seemed to be happening. I was impatient to get in the thick of it. And as proud as I was to be a ranger, guerrilla hunting was not my idea of infantry combat. Little did I know, then the starring roles that guerrilla hunting and ranger CEO John Paul Van would have later in my life. Besides, the word was that the 8th Rangers was going to be broken up soon and something in me said to move on. So I did, until I saw a sign by a road that proclaimed, Wolfhound White Rear. 
Well, if that's not a guarantee for a good fight, I don't know what is, I thought, and hightailed it to the battalion CP. The 27th Infantry Wolfhound Regiment was a colorful unit itself. The outfit had gotten its name during a stint in fighting the communists in Siberia during the Russian Revolution. In Korea, the Wolfhounds were known as the Fire Brigade because whenever there was trouble, they were sent in to save the day. They weren't a special unit, just a group of guys who thought they were good, so they were good. I had to highlight that because that just teaches you something about leadership and about morale and about attitude and about esprit de corps. You get guys and you convince them that they're good and they think they're good, they get good. They become good. I'd seen members of the outfit regularly over the last months. Whenever the 25th Recon had sent their portion of the division, was sent, had been sent their portion of the divisional front and I'd always been knocked out by the, because these guys acted more like pirates on the high seas than as a regular army regiment. To begin with, the wolfhounds wore their regimental crust, crest on their fatigues like their medal of honor. Their spirit was just incredible. They were so totally non-military in terms of what I was accustomed to. They seldom wore steel pots. They modified their gear to make it more functional and simply got rid of things that weighed them down unnecessarily. The long wooden handle of the entrenching tool, for example, was cut off so it wouldn't rub against your leg. The packs were thrown away and you carried a tramps roll, which was quickly grounded when you got into a fight. BARs were stripped of bipods and carrying handles, and scabbards were tossed with the bayonet living permanently at the end of the rifle. Grenades were carried in canteen covers. You could fit five, and if you wanted to carry a captured weapon, go for it. So these guys are got a little, a little bit of rebellion in them. Mm. Got a little rebellious attitude, which is a good thing. Got to be balanced, but it's a good thing. This renegade kind of soldiering was not only sanctioned, but encouraged by the 27th Regimental Commander and Fire Chief, World War II paratrooper, Colonel John Iron Mike Michaelis. Michaelis, who would go on to four stars, understood what made men fight. He was known for morale-boosting slogans like you're lean, you're mean, you're rough, you're tough, you're professional killers, and pre-battle pep talks like you're not here to die for your country, you're here to make those other so-and-sos die for theirs. The Wolfhound's proud, proud combat record showed that they believed him, and they had eagerly adopted their commander's no-nonsense brand of soldiering. I was more than ready to do the same. The second battalion's XO pointed the way up the road to where the rifle companies were deployed. The first unit I came to was Company G, where I reported to First Sergeant Edwin Rager. I can always use another sergeant. This giant of a top kick roared. Then and there, he assigned me to third platoon. Finally, with the assurance that I'd be picked up on the morning report, so I wouldn't be considered AWOL or or MIA, I joined my new family. At first, it was not the happiest of unions. I should have realized it wouldn't be easy. It's always a bitch to join a unit, particularly one as tight as the Wolfhounds as an individual replacement. And for some reason, it's even worse when you're an NCO or an officer. You don't know anyone and no one trusts you until you've proved yourself in battle. You get all the lousy details and only the worst battlefield horror stories. You're just the new guy. You're just fresh meat. And add insult to injury, though I'd been a squad leader and acting platoon sergeant in, in Italy and a section leader in the 25th Recon, now in the 3rd th- of the G, I found myself an assistant squad leader. I was damned unhappy with the demotion. I probably had more non-com experience than any of the squad leaders in the platoon, but the fact was that in their eyes, I was untried and all protests to the contrary fell on deaf ears. Doesn't matter who you are. Hackworth checking into a new unit. Gotta prove yourself. It didn't help I didn't help my cause that any that evening soon after my arrival when just at dusk I got caught in a, right, in a rice paddy right smack dab in the middle of a blistering 
chink mortar attack. I started to run but slipped and fell in the paddy. When I finally got back to my foxhole, I discovered that my water repellent outer trousers were covered with human shit, which the Koreans used for fertilizer. Unsurprisingly, the guy sharing my hole was unhappy about this as I was. I took off the trousers and made do for the night with two pairs of long johns and two pairs of OD trousers I had on underneath. Then I sacked out until it was my turn to go on guard, leaving my foxhole partner to contend with the lingering aroma of my accident. Guard was a grueling ritual, mainly because everyone was so tired. Each squad had its own sector, normally four foxholes, each about four yards apart. The two guys shared a hole and took turns throughout the night searching into the darkness. You'd look until you got tired, then glance at your buddy sacked out at the bottom of the hole. Then you'd look a little longer until while you thought, should I wake him now? Has he had enough sleep? Few guys had watches. To own a watch in an infantry squad during the first Korean winter was a luxury beyond imagination. So you spelled each other based on the honor system, and you only asked for relief when it was impossible to keep your eyes open any longer. Then your buddy would ask for a sit rep, and that was it. You'd be asleep almost before you'd zipped up your feather down fart sack. That's what they call those sleeping bags if you didn't pick that up the last time I used it. I did, yeah. Guys didn't even have watches. Mm. What's happening? I asked when my foxhole partner woke me for my turn. Not a thing, he replied, and he was out like a light. Still inside my sack, I sat in the darkness in the edge of the hole, got my eyeballs unglued, and tried to remember where I was. I was fantasizing about smoking a cigarette, drinking a hot cup of coffee, eating a charcoal black rare steak, and getting a squad of my own when, to my amazement, I saw a man lying prone immediately to my immediate left rear. I woke up my buddy. There's a goddamn chink almost on top of us. We whispered through our options. We could toss a grenade, blast him with a rifle, or crawl out and get him with a knife. We decided on the third alternative because the guy was right in the middle of our squad position and rifle fire or a grenade could easily start a firefight among our own guys. The chink wasn't moving and his back was to us. My buddy covered me. While I crawled out of the foxhole with my trusty M1 and 10-inch razor-sharp bayonet attached, I crouched in a crouched position. I silently slipped up behind the enemy soldier. When I got within sticking distance, I drew my rifle and thrust it with full force. Branches crackled, and it was over. I'd bayoneted my own frozen stiff trousers, which I had earlier hung over a bush behind our foxhole to dry. The next morning, I had to put the shitty things back on again, now with a hole in the ass as well. And for some reason, the fresh meat was the only one in the squad who didn't think this was very funny. So that's how he, that's, how, that's the impression he makes, his freaking stabbing his own pants, in the, his own shit-covered pants in the middle of the night. Being a new guy is hard. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it. Yeah. Being a new guy is hard. Being a new guy is very hard. Yeah. You cannot you cannot do these kind of things. It sucks when you do. Yeah. Everyone's watching you. Yeah. Uh you know, kind of when you're a new guy, kind of kind of back off a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like just take take a wrap off. Yeah, that whole first impression thing just in general. Yeah, because like the new guy, you don't have any uh, evaluation criteria. Yeah. Like there's no like you didn't yeah. you're not judged on anything because you don't have anything, you know, and then you start doing these, these weirdo things, stabbing your <laughs> your pants. You're like, OK, well, that's the, how this guy is. He stabs his own pants in the dark yep. sometimes, yep. I guess. So, yeah, you're weird. You're weird. And then so now you got to kind of make up for all that stuff yep. by doing a bunch of awesome stuff. You know, but I, I guess even beyond that, look, OK, so let's admit that it's hard. But I guess what I'm saying is err on the side of not doing dumb shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like if there's something I could maybe do this and it might make me look good. But just think about, you know, once again, be negative when you plan. Yeah. Be negative when you plan. Think to yourself, you know, that that might might make me look cool. Mm -hmm. But also if this goes sideways, it's going to look real dumb. Yeah. Uh, Have you ever seen like fail videos? 
Yes, sir. That's uh, yes, sir. I, right. Yes, very often. Yeah. I mean, those are a, a legitimate thing, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's an addiction, by the way. So, because. how many of those people, in the five seconds before they attempt their whatever they're attempting, yeah. how many of those people are actually thinking this is going to look really this is gonna cool? It's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's a, there's two of them. There's one girl, one guy, and they're the same thing. So it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to jump in this icy pond, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, with my the guy obviously has his swimsuit on. The girl mm-hmm. has her swimsuit on. Whatever. Mm-hmm. They're two separate videos, is what I'm saying. But they're the same thing. So they go, you know, the girl's like, "This okay. is why I come to you for this type of expertise, bro. Oh, yeah. This is where we. This is where the whole world wins right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the so, ultimate fail video. Yeah. So one of them for sure. They they're endless, mm-hmm. and, and I love them. But you know, great lessons in these videos. That, you know, so. Yeah, now we're talking about freaking philosophical lessons yeah. we get from fail videos. Yes. 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 I brought they, it up. They go deep. Yes. I brought it up. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm guilty. Yeah. So, you know, the girl's like, hey, okay, ready? The guy in the camera may or may not be in on it, whatever, says, okay, one, two, three, go. The girl jumps off this little pier, which is, you know, maybe two, three, three feet down uh-huh. into the water, the icy water, uh-huh. right? And the ice is just so thick that it doesn't even break. So she just oh, like God. slams onto the ice. <laughs> Whatever. There's she one of the could get too. really badly hurt. Oh, yeah. That's the thing. It's like, that's the genius. You can break of, your neck. Yeah. Or your back or your tailbone uh, and all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can People get break up. their neck a lot diving into shallow pools yeah. or shallow, you know, water, pond water or whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, luckily they they weren't trying to dive in. They were just oh, you know were a just regular jump. Oh, yeah. okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I feel a little better about it now. Yeah, I don't think that wouldn't be a good idea, even if it was thin ice to like dive. That's like some next level, like <laughs> not smart. That's but, a next level fail. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, but no, you can still get hurt. Imagine jumping off this table onto concrete. Slippery conga. That's essentially what it is, mm, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. You mean ice? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Straight up ice. Slippery conga. Doesn't break, doesn't crack. And here's the thing. I'm assuming they didn't get injured. I'm sure it hurt for sure on a couple levels. But when you watch it, it's real funny. Because yeah. you think they're going to like do like a cannonball or whatever. And it's like, it's real funny. But. Yeah, man, it's that thing. If you're the new guy and that's what you do, it's like, man, yeah, you're the guy who jumped on that ice and like jammed yourself up, you know? Yeah, just kind of reassess in those five seconds before you're about to do something. <laughs> just yeah. think, and look, I'm not saying yeah. you don't have to have courage and you got to try things, you yeah, know? Courage, yes. But just think maybe this isn't going to quite turn out the way I wanted it to. Yeah. There's a chance that this goes a little bit wrong. It's possible, yeah. And if you're a new guy, you don't have that much leadership capital to spend on recovering from this. Yeah. So just, you got to be careful. Risks and stuff. Makes sense. <sighs> Back to the book. The war seemed lost. At best, it was hopelessly confused. I'd thought wars, at least American wars, had happy endings, like capturing Berlin and Tokyo. All we were doing was yo-yoing back and forth across the Korean Peninsula. Defeat, then victory, then defeat, and defeat. With G Company 2, we were retreating, shuffling along, heading south, colder. Sometimes the temperatures were 20 degrees below zero and more tired than we'd ever been in our lives. One day, a snap thaw had us wading through mud on both sides of a mire that had once been a road. Jeeps and trucks sloshed through it too, each vehicle trying in vain to miss the rut of the vehicle in front so as to not become bogged down. One Jeep stalled and would not restart just as our column was passing by. The driver and lieutenant passenger unasked the thing. The lieutenant called for help to push it over to the side, but before we could slosh through the quagmire and give him a hand, he whipped out his pistol and aimed at one of the tires. I figured his daddy must have been an old horse soldier and this guy was going to follow through with the calf tradition of shooting his disabled mount. And for sure, pow, pow, pow. But the last shot missed the tire. It glanced off the rim and boomeranged back to strike the lieutenant right between the eyes. We pushed the Jeep and the warm, still body off the road and then returned to our column. Soon the temperature dropped, the road turned to ice, and we just kept heading south. It hadn't meant anything, the lieutenant's death. For openers, what he'd done was dumb. But more than that, we'd become immune. Fighting a war on the ground is like a working in a slaughterhouse. At first, the blood, the gore gets to you, but after a while, you don't see it. You don't smell it. You don't feel it. 
So what's another dead body? It's almost as if you don't care. In this case, we just leaned forward, kept walking, and tried to ignore the song in our heads, the ones the troops called the bug out blues. So this is the life of a ground pounder, I'd often think. The risks were higher in the recon company, but life in George was far more harsh. At least in recon, we frequently rode on the backs of our tanks and thus kept warm. In the infantry, it was just a plodding grind, one foot after the other until the column stopped and we'd flop down the sound, sound asleep before our heads touched the ground. In recon, we were seldom hungry because we stashed rations on the tanks. In the infantry, growling bellies were our constant companions. In the infantry, many men lost their will to live. Frequently, guys would just quit, drop out of the moving column, and plunk down on the side of the road, sometimes with the Chinese within sight. You'd say, come on, buddy, get up, let's go. You're going to be captured. And he'd say, I don't care, I can't go another step. A day felt like a week, and the more tired an infantry became... Uh, the, the more tired an infantryman became, the more he wanted to lighten his load. First would go the souvenirs, then his extra ammo. Next would be the bulky gear, the field coat, the pile jackets, and the down sleeping bags. Even though he knew he'd freeze that night, in the infantry I found, you live for right now. You don't give a damn about tomorrow because you don't even know if there'll be one. Get Getting... It's weird. I know you like to talk about the the long game versus the short game mm-hmm. versus the, the strategic moves versus the tactical moves. But it's interesting when you think about what's happening right now with a human being and with human beings in general, as we encounter stress, as we encounter pain and suffering, we start to focus on just a short term, just a short term win. Mm. And think about that in a, from a life perspective. I mean, here you are. You know it's going to be freezing tonight. Mm-hmm. You know it's going to be freezing, but you don't want to carry this down sleeping bag anymore. So you just leave it. Yeah. Think about how crazy that is. But we make decisions all the time that are that stupid. Mm-hmm. But we want that short-term gratification. Well, in a lot of cases, relief. Like short term relief, short term relief. Know, which yep. I, I guess, as far as the game goes, same thing. So it's like re- relief, gratification, you know, whatever. Yeah, like there's a difference, but in the game, as far as the game's concerned, that's yeah. what you're going for, you know. And like, like a craving, right? Yeah, craving. Like that's relief yeah. from that's the put, craving. That's, that's throwing away your your down sleeping bag. Sleeping bag. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. It's going to feel good right now. Like you just got rid of three pounds. Yep. And the, by the way, back in the day, like these down sleeping bags, you know, like nowadays things are <laughs> feather light, a little bit different, you know, yeah. Yeah. this is probably four or five pounds, oh, which yeah. is a big difference when you're hauling that thing. Oh, yeah. But think about what that does. Think about, well, you're right, man. It's a craving, right? It's when you say, oh, I really want to eat those Cheetos. Yep. It's just not going oh, away. I just, I just want to, oh, I just, those Cheetos are going to be good. Yep. And then even when you, after you eat your, I don't know, chicken salad or whatever, Cheetos still sound kind of good, you know? It's still like a little little thing that yeah. needs relief, Just like you know? dumping this, my, my down parka. Yeah. That could keep me warm. Yep. But it, I think what it has to do with, see, there's a, there is a difference. What it has to do with is like one is caused by suffering. Yeah. And you just get into this mode of just basically surrender. Maybe yeah. that is what happens in life. Maybe you get to a point where you just kind of surrender to where you're at. Yeah. You just kind of accept like, hey, this is just me. Yeah. And oh, now, yeah. you know, Cheetos, no Cheetos, whatever, donut, no yeah. donut, ah, oh, the donut. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, accepting where you're at. Yeah. And it's like, because where you're at can, is, is a place in your mind too. You know how like, even if you're, you're making progress, but you're used to not making progress, yeah. you know, when you're really used to it. Yep. It can happen like with my, like, if you have like a certain amount of money in your bank account mm-hmm. when you're a kid or young man, mm-hmm. whatever. If you're used to having like, you know, $20 in there, yeah. like just constantly, that's sort of the, the baseline or whatever. Yeah. And then you're like, then you get a hundred or 500, or 900. Ooh, but you're used to having 20 
it's like, yeah, like I'm making progress. I'm saving money. I'm saving, but you're used to having 20. So yeah. you'll, you then know, you go out and buy that big screen TV. There's a, there's a chance that that'll <laughs> Get yourself happen. That you know? down to 20. Yeah, exactly. Right. You accept where you're, you accept your place. Accept it. You, know? you can't do that. Yeah. Basically. It's a bad yeah. idea. Yeah. Like you have to like actively maybe like raise your st- for real, raise your standard. Yep. Now, when you get the 900 in there, now the new standard is, I don't know, make it realistic, I guess, but a thousand. Eight, 800 should be the standard, mm-hmm. like the baseline now, you know? So sure, you got some wiggle room, maybe you're not perfect, maybe it's new to you, okay, but the standard is eight. Like you start going below eight, that's the same thing as having negative kind mm-hmm. of attitude. But you gotta really establish it in your head, you know? It's hard though. Very, very. Because very, people are very. where they are and they kind of get used to it. That's why they. That's why they are where they are. Cause yeah. they're literally used to it. Yeah. You know, not like, per, like, pretend used to it. Is it good to get? Well, never mind. Is it? It's good to get that new standard and actually stay there long enough that you feel it. Yeah. That you get used to the new standard. That's the tricky part. Yeah. You feel good, but then you're like, oh, well, and then you go back to your normal ways. For, yep. First craving that comes about, <sighs> satisfying the craving relief from the cra however you want to put it like even like when you say suffering it's kind of like well what does that really mean you know i mean there's certain levels of suffering for sure Mm -hmm. like you can go deep into human suffering for sure but really to some people like not having a drink suffering you know when they're like or have a craving for ice cream or something like this it's like to it's kind of like so it's suffering you know that's really a horrible stretch isn't it i mean really to think like i can't have ice cream i'm suffering well, any kind of addiction, I, I'm assuming, you know, like I, I've the only addiction I've really dealt with as far as like seeing people is like a cigarette scenario mm-hmm. where they're like craving a cigarette so much. And it's like, man, it kind of seems like you're kind of suffering. Right now, <laughs> I guess I my you know? my contention here is that not having ice cream, we cannot uh, equ- equivocate that. To, you can't do it huh? to suffering. suffering. <laughs> I, I understand. Yes. Bottom line is, let's be careful that we aren't thinking short term. Let's hang on to our sleeping bag. Let's carry the extra weight because in the long run, it's going to pay off. Yeah, that's That's what I'm getting at. That seems like obvious suffering where you're like, hey, I'm going to need that tonight. You know, I'm going to literally need that to stay alive. Possibly. Yeah. Not the kind where, oh, that'll be that'll serve nice tonight. That'll be cool tonight. It's not that I'm going to need that tonight Mm. or I risk death. And yet, right now, my suffering is so bad, I got I to get rid of it to not have it tonight. I'd re- oh, yeah, man. That is. Back to the book. Now and then, if we were really lucky, we'd stop in a village and comm- commandeer an abandoned house for 10 or 20 winks. A Korean home had hard adobe mud floors under which lay an oven, the purpose of which was to provide central heating for the entire house. Of course, American soldiers had no idea how these things worked. And the first time around, we built the biggest fire we could and went to sleep shivering and bitching that the gooks didn't know how to do anything right. It turned out though, that the previous occupants of the of our temporary abode had the last laugh. Throughout the night, the floors got hotter and hotter until some of the guy's jackets spontaneously combusted and the ammo we'd laid on the floor blew up. Snow never looked so good. (laughs) So you're going one extreme to the other. On most nights, though, to stave off the cold, we'd employed the old soldier's tricks from the bleak, frozen days of Valley Forge. One was to stuff hay in a poncho and wrap it so tightly around two guys to keep in the body heat. Another was to fill your steel pot with coals and embrace it all night long, a practice that continued despite a number of tired soldiers who died this way from asphyxiation. Another was to put a slug through your foot. In other words, shoot yourself in the foot. I'd thought about that one. Most of us did but it always seemed too risky. You might blow your foot off, you might get caught and court-martialed, but one bitterly cold night when I would have done anything to get out of that place, I came up with a perfect solution. If I emptied most of the powder out of a grenade, I could toss it into my foxhole and blame it on a sneaky Chinaman. Better yet, if I chipped the trench on the side of the foxhole with my bayonet, I could contain the damage to my leg only. All I'd have to do would be lay my body in the trench and stick my leg in the hole, toss in a frag grenade, and bang! Million dollar wound. It was a wonderful idea. 
somehow a lot better than the one I'd often saw during a firefight when a guy would stay in his hole and wave his arms or kick his legs like a chorus dancer hoping to catch a slug and the first boat back to the States. And I spent all night digging away, working on the trench and thinking how warm I'd be back in Santa Monica. The war vet who got it in the leg. I chipped and chipped away on the frozen ground, completely forgetting about the cold, the time, the fact that I needed some sleep, or that my buddy who was sleeping uh, sleeping behind the hole may have had enough. Finally, it was ready. I hoisted myself into the trench, prepared the grenade, and dangled my leg in the hole. And I was just about to pull that pin when I saw the most beautiful sight, a sight that every infantryman in Korea dreamed of seeing. It was the sun slowly rising. It meant the terrible night was over. It meant I could light my fire and be warm again. So I forgot my little trench and for a moment forgot the other thing the sun meant. The beginning of yet another long day, another step south, the never ender ending a bitter taste of defeat in all our mouths. So this is hack. <laughs> this up. is freaking Hackworth who just went AWOL to go because he didn't think his troops were fighting hard enough. He gets to the front lines. He's he's is where he wants to be. And he even Hack is thinking about either shooting himself or in the foot. And then beyond thinking about, it, he comes up with a scheme with a grenade, and he actually executes the entire plan other than the actual event itself. And the only thing that stops him is that the sun's coming up. That's that's freaking insane. Yeah. And and I'll tell you, you know what I take away from that. Hold on a little bit longer, the sun's gonna come up. Yeah. Hold on a little bit longer, the sun's gonna come up. I posted something about that the other day mm-hmm. because I was watching the sun go down and going through SEAL training mm-hmm. when the sun's going down and you know the instructors will be, they line you up and they say, good night, say good night to the sun, gents. It's gonna be a long, cold, wet night. And they're just making, trying to make people think, mm-hmm. hey, you got, Whatever, however many hours it's gonna be dark for, 12, eight, nine, it's gonna suck. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna suck. And that's what they want you to think about, mm. how much it's gonna suck. But if in the back of your mind you go, eh, sun will come up in the morning. Mm. They can't stop that from happening. Mm. Yeah. So you get in that tough situation, remember, the sun's gonna come up. I don't know, man. You I can f- get through it, man. Yeah, you gotta admit though, man, I kind of felt him for a little bit when he's like digging the thing and and thinking about how warm he's gonna be. It's in like Santa man. Monica. He had his full fantasy <laughs> outstretched in front of him. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And then I mean, it, and then it then the standard starts to get shifted, kind of like, oh yeah, you're almost kind of used to like the warmth that you can imagine, you know, and to have that warmth kind of just taken away, meaning you gotta shift your plan back to like the reality or whatever. Man, I can see how that could be hard. He's even got the fantasy of like, hey, the war vet. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I got, yeah, got, got hit in the leg. Yeah. He's got his whole fantasy planned out. He's ready to execute on this thing. Whew, I wonder, and this guy is like born for combat. Yeah. And that's how shitty this situation gets. Yeah, and that's like another thing it says, like how, like, how Imagine shitty Imagine what the other gets. people are thinking. Oh, yeah. Imagine what somebody that doesn't really want to be there. Oh, yeah. Imagine what f- going through their freaking minds. Yeah. Back to the book. And then, as if overnight, everything changed. It turned out that despite the fact that I never saw a general on the battlefield, apparently one Lieutenant General Matthew Ridgway had been all over the, in- Engl- the Eighth Army front assessing the situation and making his plans. I rode in an open Jeep he would later write in his memoirs, and would permit no Jeep with the top up to operate in the combat zone. Riding in a closed vehicle in a battle area puts a man in the wrong frame of mind. It gives him an erroneous sense of warmth, of safety. His mental attitude is that of an ostrich poking his head in the sand. Also, I held the old fashioned idea that it helped spirits of the men to see the old man up there in the snow and sleet and the mud, sharing the same cold, miserable existence that they had to endure. As a consequence, I damn near froze." End quote. Nevertheless, Ridgway persevered. 
with no quarter given. He banned the word retreat from the English language, at least insofar as correspondence could describe our miserable truck to the south. Quote, I'm more interested in your plans for attack, he told a staff officer when the latter offered up those for another withdrawal. He even re- he recognized even before we did that the Chinese offensive was running out of steam and sought to take advantage of it with deep patrols to the north to find out exactly how stretched the enemy was. Operation Wolfhound was the first of these, and the fire brigade under the command of Colonel Mike Ellis or Mike Ellis one of General Ridgway's World War II airborne protégés was on the attack once more. So now you have a totally different situation. The guy goes to the front line and he actually sees what's happening. Mm-hmm. And not only does he see what his troops are going through, but he also sees what's happening with the Chinese. He sees them start to get thinned out. He sees maybe there's not as much pressure as he originally saw. Mm-hmm. So he can say, look, all right, we're done retreating. Here we go. Back to the book. Two platoons of G Company and elements of the 89th Tank Battalion made up one of the task forces. Named for and commanded by our own company commander, Jack Michaeli, Task Force Michaeli was given the mission of taking Su Wan, and on the 16th of January, it did just that. The enemy was totally unprepared for the daring daylight assault. George was outside of artillery range, Captain Michaeli, an old horse cav man approached Suwan in the only way possible, frontally, down a road, never probed for mines, and fast. My platoon, the third, was not involved in the Blitzkrieg operation at all, but when the other guys came back, having killed 150 enemy without a casualty of their own, in high spirits, and with stories of Captain Mike Lee sauntering across the streets of Suwan while enemy machine gun slugs thudded all around him, our morale went sky high. We were ready to take on the world. Meanwhile, I got my squad and immediately set about instilling it with the trust, standards, and beliefs about the way things should be done. So so he has now given a squad because he just showed up there and even though he's a new guy and even though he stabbed his own pair of shit covered pants with a bayonet in the middle of the night, he is still given a squad. So I have to back up a little bit. So he talks about this trust, capital R, capital T, capital R, capital U, capital S, capital T. When he first got in the army, as I mentioned, he went to Europe. When he went to Europe, he was not in combat because the war was over, but there was these old timers there. And he explains, I'm gonna abbreviate a little bit, but he kind of talks about what it was like and where he developed his I want to say his personality, really, and and you know, like I was, I always tell people when you when you go in the SEAL teams, your first platoon leaves a big mark on you, mm. and definitely your first two platoons, and the teams have become a lot more similar than they used to be. All the different SEAL teams, mm. they're a lot more similar than they used to be. It, it, they used to be they used to have much more of their own personalities. Team one. The nickname for Team One, which is where I was, was Stalag Team One because it was, you know, you had uniforms inspections and you had, you know, everyone had short hair and they inspected your haircuts and all this stuff. Team Five was kind of, you know, they were kind of wild, kind of just do, you know, they had no inspections and they were just kind of, they had the, they had the image of being more wild. Then Team Three was sort of, a little bit in between, but they were also sort of, um, they seemed like shy, for lack of a better word. Like Team 3 was just kind of, like they were just doing, over there doing their thing. They were also disconnected because they were deploying to Southwest Asia back then. Mm-hmm. And Team 1 and Team 2 were deploying to Southeast Asia. So they were a little bit disconnected, mm-hmm. which made them seem a little bit more shy. I guess, I, I don't know if that's the right word, but they were just a little bit more, they were all kind of on their own program. Yeah. Team one on one end of the spectrum, Stalag team one, team five kind of wild, team three somewhere in the middle. They, everyone had their own personalities. And, t- and the East Coast had their own personalities too. And they kind of lined up a little bit, except for the fact that team two and team one were sort of the traditional old school ones. That's why when I went from team one to the East Coast, I, I tried to go to team two and I did. Mm-hmm. Team four was more like the wild one, team eight was kind of in the middle. Mm-hmm. That's back in the day. Now the teams are very similar because they all kind of are on the same rotation. You're going the same 
types of deployments, so they're much more similar. But wherever you spend your early days leaves an impression on you. And that's kind of what happened to Hack. He shows up into this environment, and I'm gonna go into it here. Back to the book, gradually, so now we're going back in time, it's the end of World War II, the fighting's over, but he's, he's deployed and he's in Europe. Back to the book, gradually most of the World War II warriors that went back to the States and the post-war Wild West feeling of lawlessness went too. It had been great fun for a kid to be part of the hell for leather spirit that made up the 752nd, the 75 deuce, but like the tightening of a screw, one turn at a time each day the unit became more military. The who gives a damn attitude of the remaining 752nd combat leaders and troopers replaced by the exacting discipline of the peacetime army. For the next four years, I learned my trade. One year with the recon company of the tank battalion in the Po Valley and three more months with Trieste United States Troops. And this is where the an acronym TRUST comes from. Trieste United States Troops, the illustrious unit whose 5,000 hand-picked members Walter Winchell called, quote, the chrome-plated soldiers of Europe. We worked hard during those years, long, merciless days of training, repeating, training, repeating, repeating until we got it right. Our transformation into soldiers inspired and monitored by those battle-savvy and NCOs who well knew that discipline and tactical proficiency on the battlefield were the direct results of discipline and combat skills instilled on the parade and training grounds. At night it was down on our hands and knees, all of us, hand waxing the barracks floors until we had enough money to chip in and buy a buffer. You could eat off those floors just as you could just as you could almost be blinded by the brass belt buckles and brown boots that each of us wore, polished every night to a dazzling finish. The only way out of these activities was sick call, but rarely was it used as an excuse. It took as much effort to see the dock. You had to strip your bed, cram all your perfectly pressed clothes into a duffel bag, see the supply sergeant and then the first sergeant, not to mention the lion's share of a month's pay you'd spend having your clothes repressed when you came back, as it did to continue with the normal routine. Punishment was meted out by a process known as NCO justice. (laughs) I love saying that. (laughs) For crimes such as a uniform of less than starched perfection, a bed that didn't bounce a quarter, or even a mildly insubordinate smirk, the sentence could range from 50 push-ups to double timing around the parade field, holding a 9.5 pound M1 rifle over your head, yelling, I'm a shithead, I'm a shithead, until you collapsed. We rarely saw an officer above our platoon leader, and he was seldom with the troops because of administrative duties, but no one seemed too concerned about it. Above and below the chain of command, it was well recognized that as fathers, teachers, older brothers, and chief tormentors in Trieste, the NCO Corps had no equal. So that's what he's talking about when he's talking about this trust attitude of discipline and training hard. That's where it comes from. So so now we're back to Korea. We're back to him getting a squad and here's what he does. Meanwhile, I got my squad and immediately set about instilling it with my trust standards and beliefs about the way things should be done. I got out a notebook and wrote down each man's name, rank and serial number, his blood type, weapon number, next of kin, and whatever training and combat experience he had. I started demanding that rifles be cleaned and that shoulders shape up. If I saw a soldier walking around without his weapon, the next thing he knew he'd be on the deck crawling to it. While I stood by kicking him and telling him that with each kick was that he was being uh, hit with a slug, brutal stuff. I'd learned it in basic training when Lieutenant Kramer at the Fort Knox rifle range kicked my arm until I positioned it correctly under my weapon. But that's how a guy learns. Besides, better my foot and a mythical slug than an enemy slug and a goodbye friendly foot, arm, or life. <laughs> That's how a guy learned. You want to talk about a politically incorrect, unpopular thing to say. Yeah. I remember when I was a new guy. I remember some of the older guys. 
saying to me, you know, sometimes people need to get beaten so that they learn. Mm. And you know what I said? That's correct. Mm. It's actually accurate. <clears throat> I hate to say it, because everyone hate, I don't, I don't hate to say it. It's the truth. Like sometimes you need to learn a lesson the hard way. Yeah. And if you don't think it's a big deal, oh, whatever. It's a big deal. Yeah. So that's what he's saying. That's how a guy learns. Once again, what do we have? We have 18, 19, 17, 21 year old men who's, f- what is it? The frontal cortex? What is it? The frontal lobe? <laughs> sure. They're not free. They're not fully <laughs> developed yet. <laughs> yeah. They understand physicalness, yeah. physicality. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those things that it's kind of universally mm-hmm. like understood. You know, pain is not good. You know, yeah. And some people can take more pain than others for sure, but mm-hmm. after a while, it's like we all kind of don't like pain. Yeah. Eh, of course, of course, there's weirdos or whatever, but <clears throat> for the most part, there are like these things that if you start to threaten, it's yeah. like you know, it's valuable to people. He, here's the other thing. This is a this is a fucking harsh environment, right? This is war. You're getting people ready for war. You're getting people ready to kill. You're getting people ready to freeze. You're getting people ready to suffer. You're getting people ready to have to march for miles and miles and miles with no food, with no sleep. Like this is what the job entails. Yeah. And if you think you can pamper someone and that's going to effectively prepare them for those type of situations, I don't think that's accurate. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Back to the book. My guys thought I was crazy and a prick to boot. They still didn't believe I paid my pat- my battlefield dues. Little did they know that they were doing the paying in spades for making me get that sergeant combat feeling all over again. Then came 6 February, which we talked about on the last podcast. Part of another reconnaissance and force mission, codenamed Operation Thunderbolt, which turned into a full-scale attack, and I never got a complaint again. So after his performance, which we talked about on 249, what he did to lead that day, back to the book, in fact, the reaction was the direct opposite. No longer was I the hard-ass sergeant who arrived out of the blue with strange ideas of discipline and training. Now I was just Hack. Hack, the great fighter who'd gotten shot in the head, courageously saving lives and inflicting punishment on the enemy. It was a great relief, knowing I would not have to prove myself to anyone anymore. But what I didn't know at the time was that the name I made for myself on 6 February 1951 was one I'd have to live up to for the next 20 years. So he, and and this is a story that gets repeated throughout his life. He kind of shows up somewhere. He has the hardcore mentality. People kind of question it, but then they see how it enables them and, and, and protects them in combat, and then they're kind of they're 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 down for the cause. Yeah. Back to the book. It seemed ironic that the thing that saved my life on that day was the very thing I hated most in Korea: the cold. The blood kept pumping, and this is when he's referring back to when he got shot in the head. The blood kept pumping, but it froze almost as soon as it came out of my head. After the doc patched me up with a Carlisle bandage, I radioed Captain Mackay, uh, Michael Lee and gave him a sit rep. I'd already appointed another NCO to skip the platoon. Mike Lee told me that to head for the road behind which Gilcrest platoon was fighting. He would send a litter jeep there to pick me up. The platoon doc, always worried about his flock, wanted to tag along. I told him I'd make it, policed up one of our dead's M1s and headed off. I kept low using the rice paddy walls and irrigation ditches for cover. I probably wouldn't have felt it if I'd gotten hit again anyways because during my run back down the drainage ditch, I'd fallen through the ice and been soaked from the waist down. The water and zero degree weather had turned my lower... my lower torso into a block of ice. My head was spinning and my balls were frozen and I wasn't sure which one worried me more. Then I came upon PFC Charles, the guy I'd earlier tasked to take the two North Korean POWs we'd captured during that morning to the old man for interrogation. 
Charles was sitting in a drainage ditch by the road eating a can of sea rations. At his feet were the prisoners stretched out in the ditch, dead, each from a single bullet in the back of the head. I was outraged. Why'd you kill them? They tried to escape, he said simply, but I didn't believe him. Besides, he continued, I wasn't going to risk my ass to get two gooks out of here. There wasn't much I could do. I told him to report back to the platoon. Gilcrest later told me that Charles had received word only days before that his brother had been killed in action over in the second division. Not too good a choice for an escort, hack, he'd remark, drawing on his pipe. I continued on. Small arms and machine gun fire was skipping down the road. I gave it all a big miss and kept to my little ditch. I headed south until I met Lieutenant Colonel Gordon Murch, our old battalion CO, who was controlling the battle from his tactical CP behind a roadside knoll a few hundred yards from the front. There I was placed on a litter in a medical jeep, and as we bumped down the road, all I could think was hallelujah, got it made, I'm leaving this goddamn place. Or so I thought, because just then the Jeep's radio crackled on. First platoon, George Company, got a serious wound, real bad. Get there fast. He'll be on the side of the road. I couldn't believe it. Let me out. I'll wait here. So there's he's getting out of it or on this Jeep, and all of a sudden over the radio says, hey, we need that Jeep back here. And Hackworth's thinking, let me out, bro. Let me out. I'll wait here, I thought, but I was too weak, too tired, too cold to get the words out. The Jeep spun around and headed back up that fire-swept road, past Colonel Murch, right into the jaws of the whole goddamn communist army. We stopped. The medics calmly sauntered out to pick up the other casualty. They took all the time in the world, or so it seemed, while the enemy used the large red cross markings on the Jeep for target practice. The Jeep's canvas sides were being ventilated. The slugs were passing above and below my litter. I felt totally helpless and swore that whoever the wounded guy was I would hate him for life which from the way things were going was not going to be long it turned out he was a buddy through the Hawaiian mafia connection a handsome six-footer named Ray Mendez I almost kept my kept to my word though when I found out his critical wound to be a slug in the thigh when he'd been hit he'd rolled up in a ball blood had squirted out of his leg all over the front of his jacket and someone had concluded that he had taken it in the gut oblivious to the fight raging on all sides of our thin-skinned ambulance Jeep Mendez became chirpier and chirpier as we headed out of the battle area he sang praises of his million dollar wound and spun dreams about his in imminent return to the islands me one big war hero bra he said <laughs> the regimental collection collecting station was jammed with casualties the surgeon who bent over my litter was covered with blood like a butcher we're going to bypass division clearing and send you straight to mash at suwan he said you're on your way home the next stop was quick mash was near the emergency runway at suwan the doc there wrote on my wounded leg on my wounded tag emergency air evac which somehow scared me and before i knew it i was strapped down to the deck of a c-47 we took off just at dark why don't they close the goddamn door i thought it had to be open because i'd never been colder i was shaking like a jackhammer i couldn't feel my hands or feet a flight nurse stayed right with me another ominous sign ominous sign so he's getting like they, they put air evac immediately he's like oh god that means i must be really wounded bad he's got this flight nurse staying right with him she piled on blanket after blanket with no effect just as i was reaching the point where i didn't know if i could take it anymore we landed in pusan and it was another world paradise in fact a heated ambulance was waiting as they loaded me in i felt like that old bull weevil who lived in the red hot fire mighty warm but nice i'd found a home i fell asleep and didn't wake up again until i was being winched aboard the hospital ship uss haven in pusan harbor i opened my eyes and everything i saw was white clean and oh so warm medics were starched the nurses all looked like doris day i was stripped placed in crisp white sheets with soft blue blankets. I was safe and suddenly starving. 
A medic came down to the immediate rescue with a delicious hot meal. I wolfed it down just in time for the next wonder of wonders, a beautiful young nurse in a tight little white outfit who came to clean me up. Why didn't I join the Navy, I thought. Except for my bath in the Korean tub, I hadn't washed in more than two months. I was caked with dry blood, Korean mud, and God only knew what else. Each time the nurse scraped off one filthy layer, she'd have to change the sheets and start again. It took four sheet changes with no help from me because as a head wound, I wasn't allowed to move at all. Next, the poor girl had to shave off my ratty beard. Bad hygiene and ingrown hairs had covered my face with boil like pimples. It was too terrible to be funny, watching the nurse bobbing and weaving all over the place to avoid flying debris every time that razor hit one of the anti-personnel mines buried in my cheeks. The next few days were a haze. Sleep, really hard sleep, people standing over me having whispered consultations, Blood, IV, x-ray after x-ray, doctors probing, asking questions, how many fingers do you see? I slowly regained my strength. Someone, somebody commandeered my Waltham watch. I never saw it again. The sleep was good. I caught up on months of it lost. But then I started getting re- restless. The ward, though spotlessly clean and staffed with talented, delicated, dedicated pros, was an extremely depressing place. We were all head wounds most either terminal or vegetable cases. It was amazing that many, it was amazing that many young boys, all of them were still sucking in air. One guy had tubes running out of everywhere. He'd caught a slug right between the eyes. I wanted out. I'd had my little vacation. I told the docs I'm ready to return to my platoon. There's nothing wrong with me. The doctors probably thought that the bullet had done some pretty serious damage to my brain. Nobody wanted to go back to the front. They didn't realize that the guys in 3rd Platoon were my brothers, my family, and I loved them. I'd only been with them three weeks, it was true, but in combat, that's a lifetime, and I didn't want to leave them out there alone. If by being there, I could help keep them alive, keep them out of a head wound ward. I want to go back, I kept telling them. Well, he did go back. He healed up. He healed up pretty quickly and went back to his platoon uh, by mid-March. So he was out for maybe a month and a half. And, you know, this book is just incredibly good. By the way, that's page 69 of an 800 page book. That's where we're at. Page 69 of an 800 page book. Just in Korea, he's going to get two more Purple Hearts. He's going to get battlefield commissioned. He's going to take command of a new raider unit. He's going to go on offense against the enemy. He's going to get awarded three silver stars. Then he's going to go back to America. He's going to volunteer for another tour with the 40th Infantry Division. And then that war is going to end, and he's going to stay in the army, and he's going to go through all the political things that you have to go through to move up the chain of command, and then he's going to eventually deploy to Vietnam as a battalion operations officer, as a battalion commander. He's going to go there with with SLA Marshall, and then he's going to go, and he's going to be a battalion commander for the 439th Infantry. And eventually, he conducts his his famous or his infamous interview, depending on how you look at it, with the issues and answers where he disparages a lot of the senior army and a lot of the civilian leadership, after which he is drummed out of the army rapidly. And all the, I mean, these events that that take place, they're all documented with such detail and it just gives so much information about leadership, about human nature, about the way people act, about why people do what they do. <sighs> There's so much to learn from this book. So 
we're almost at two hours right now. Uh, it, what an honor it was for me to have written the forward to this thing, this book that had such a huge impact on me. Check it out, check out the book. Well, one thing that's cool about it is you don't have to, look, it's 800 pages long, you, can, you don't have to read the whole book mm. in one sitting. You know the story. I just told you the story. The story is about a guy that's that's that freaking loves his troops throughout his career, and you pick it up anywhere and you read what he's going through for two or three pages. I guarantee you'll get a lesson out of it. It's it's that good, and you don't have you don't have to read the whole thing at once. You will. You'll want to because you'll want to know what's going to happen. Mm. Like I said, we we're on page sixty nine right now. And by the way, we skipped a bunch. I skipped a whole section because he got, he kind of talks about. The, the opening action scene that I talked about. Yeah. Then he kind of goes into how he ended up in the army and goes through the World War II and he goes through the trust troops and all that. Then he picks back up with Korea. So we didn't even cover, we probably covered 40 pages out of an 800 page book. Hmm. So check out the book. It will teach you valuable leadership lessons and it will teach you how to become smarter as a leader and it will teach you how to become a better person about face Colonel David Hackworth speaking of being better echo Charles yes sir do you have any let's say recommendations sure recommendations well actually back to the Hawaiian guy me mm. one big war hero bro yeah it's not me he didn't say me what did he say? I. Because in Pigeon, no, well, yeah, I, I'm uh, sure Hackworth, see. I'm sure Hackworth maybe remembered it incorrectly. Hackworth was wrong is what I'm hearing. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just saying in Pigeon, you don't say me. I might have read it wrong. No, that's what he says. Yeah, he says me one big war, war hero, bra. Yeah. So I, he used I, incorrect Pigeon. I one big war hero, bra. Okay. Also, right it kind of reminded me like, this just totally never thought about this, but when, I, when I'm realizing in Pigeon, you say one instead of a, like a, uh, like, hey, toss mm. me a beer, whatever. Toss me one beer. One beer, yeah. Mm. It's weird. It's like a subtle difference right there. Toss because I one beer? No, not, no, no, no. I, <laughs> you say I, like for I. But one is like, you know, like in non-Pigeon, we'll mm. say, for lack of a better term, you, you, you say one as it only when the option of more than one is considered in the scenario, you know? Mm -hmm. But in Pigeon, you just say one just means, A, whether two or more or whatever is considered or not. Got it. See what I'm saying? Toss me one beer, bro. Mm -hmm. I want big war hero as opposed to I'm two big war heroes. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I want beer. I'm a big war. You see, you see the translation, yeah. right? I'm glad. That's why you're here, man. Yep, Breaking the, down that Pigeon. <laughs> If need be, yes. Yes. All right. So, okay, becoming better. So I was thinking about this the other day. You know, my neighbors are over, and they asked, hey, do you work out every day? Mm -hmm. I was like, well, yeah, well, I try to, mm -hmm. you know, the whole deal. Mm -hmm. You work out every day, right, Jocko? Yes. Every day, like seven days a week. I mean, that's kind of the, the, the plan, yeah, the here's deal. Here's the deal. Uh, I will try and work out every single day. Sometimes... You have a travel day. You know, yeah. the flight's at 6.15. Yeah. I got to bed at 11. Do I, am I going to get up at 3.15? Or, or no, even earlier than that, 3? No, my body could probably use the extra sleep more than it could use the workout. Yeah, exactly. But I know that there are days like that out there. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I don't voluntarily take days off. Yeah. Yeah. So, and... Kind of, yeah, I dig it. Same deal, more or less, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but why, like, why do you work out every day? I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying you ever think about, like, why do you work out every day, uh, you know? And then, like, how do you work out every day? Like, what, like, why, why? I work out every day so I can stay in shape, bro. Yeah, but you don't have to work out every day to stay in shape. That's okay. the thing. Well, there I has to be more to it than that. I think it's good for you. Mentally and physically. You see, there you go. Mentally, mm -hmm. right? Mentally, that's so. That's such a broad thing to say, though, mm -hmm. too. And, and okay. I mean that in a good way. I don't mean it like, whoa, that's a cop. I'm not saying that. I'm okay. saying like that's yeah, mentally. Man, that's a big deal. Mentally, where that's part of like essentially like your life. You know, it's part of like who you are. Yeah. You know, like that's the discipline. 
Yeah. And there's a lot of things like that, but they seem like real small because so many people do it. You know how like, you know, some people, they, they make their bed every single day, right? Mm-hmm. There's that. And then there's like, okay. Then you get all the way down the spectrum, like obvious yeah. things like, oh, I brush my teeth every day or whatever, yeah. you know? But man, you're essentially, if you want to call it the path, like working out every day mm-hmm. beyond the physical benefits and you know whatever Mm -hmm. being stronger whatever working out every day is like it's one of those things where if you can adjust your standard to that Mm -hmm. in that way that's a good thing that it that'll yeah that'll keep you that'll keep you in a place that's like i guess that's why we call it the path it'll keep you on the path yeah i think that developing a pattern is very positive. Right. So in and a way, sticking to the pattern. Yeah. Once you deviate, let's face it, you lose momentum. And that's a good way to develop a pattern as far as staying in shape, working out. Because let's face it, like working out a lot of times, like we can consider that as like kind of low on the priority list mm-hmm. for a lot of reasons. And I understand. But if your whole thing is like, no, I work out every day the same way I freaking brush, like, my teeth. brush my teeth every day. You know, it's like part of the day. I floss my teeth every day. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like one of those things. Too, that started you know? when I joined the Navy. What? Flossing? They said floss your teeth every day. I was like, okay. And I started doing it every day. <laughs> cool, man. Yeah. See, and that's good. It's The reason I laugh is because it's funny how it's like that simple for you. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> it's like the dentist like, tells you to floss oh, every yeah. day. You get told and that like, your whole life, but then they're like, yeah. okay. They say, hey, floss your teeth every day. Okay. Yeah. Roger that. So, yeah. Hey, how about this? Work out every day. Every single day. It's a good move. Well, but it is a good way so what you, what to you, get you, I feel path. like there's some place where you're going with this. I no. feel like this is a building up to some statement. Yeah, and here's the, it's not building up to a statement. Okay. It's kind of well, revealing. Well, that's kind of a big letdown. Because <laughs> <laughs> no. no. I was thinking you had some kind no. of philosophical eureka moment. Yeah, I mean. I, but basically I mean, what you're saying is work out every day. I have. I had a and philosophical moment. If it took you that moment. long to say it, it's kind of making me wonder. I'm telling you why you should work out every day. Because let's okay. face it, like if you just say, "Hey, work out every day," there's a lot of pushback you can get. Like, no, you need rest days. No, you need, you mm-hmm. know, like mm-hmm. there's a there's you know there's a big philosophy to it. But working out every day, just like how you said, which I'm glad you did, by the way, it's it's a it's a mental thing. Yes. And of course, physical, but discipline. that's obvious. Yeah, it's a mental thing. So, and then you additionally you said. To, you know, make it a, what, a routine or whatever. Like, it's just part of your day. Develop a pattern. Develop a pattern. Yes, exactly right. That's a good way to develop the pattern is you just automatically yep. assume and do it every day. Just automatic. Yep. That's part of the day, you know? Not like, oh, I want to try to get a workout in today. You know, it's yep. not that. Yep. It's like, that's it's more of a given, you know, kind Pe- of thing. It's a weird thing that I'll say to people. Be like, how do you do <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah, that. That's or they're like, "What do you say to yourself?" I don't say anything. Yeah, I don't even. Th- it's a weird thing to say. I don't even think about it. Yeah, I don't sit there and be like, "Well, yeah. you know, I have worked out for five days straight, so I really probably don't actually need to work out today." Mm. I could use, you know, it's like, you know, I actually read once four years ago in a muscle and fitness magazine that, you know, five days in a row is a bit too much to work out. You yeah. should take that whatever day off. Yeah. You always can find 80 million ways to rationalize. Oh, Did yeah. you know that the Bulgarians actually, on their periodization cycle, they only take, you know, like Dude. there's a million different. <laughs> I was reading about Michael Phelps, and even though he trained hard, there was always one day a week that he would just rest. Right. Like everyone's got a million different rationalizing things that you can put in your head. Yeah. Yeah, even though they're you not should get, Michael yeah, Phelps. That's, that's the rationalizing thing. There's a, there's a TV show that uh, it's called Alone. It's and called Alone. Okay. It's a TV show called Alone. They put people out in the wilderness. I heard about it on Joe Rogan because oh. he had one of the winners on the show. Mm. And I didn't even hear that. I just heard Joe Rogan mention it. He was like, yeah, this show is crazy. They put them out. And so I was with my wife and my youngest daughter and they were looking for something to watch. And I go, I go, well, hey, there's a show called Alone. It's about being alone in the wilderness. Mm. Long story short, everyone quits. And yeah. you, 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 the show goes on until only one person is left. Okay. Everyone else quits. So they're I, in different places. They're, obviously, they're alone, they're alone in the wilderness. Okay, they're but, alone in the wilderness. They oh, with to, each other though. No, okay. they're alone, isolated. Alone. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. alone. So as you watch this, you see people, 
and they're they have cameras with them, so they're talking to themselves. Yeah. And it's been funny to watch because you can see people when they're gonna quit. Yeah. And you're like, oh, they're rationally. So now, now I've got my youngest daughter who's 11. Mm-hmm. When someone starts rationalizing, <laughs> she says, oh, he's rationalizing. Because yeah. you know, someone will say, you know, I could stay out here for a long time, but you know, I really miss my family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh, he's rationalizing. Mm-hmm. Or, or I just don't know if it's worth, you know, what this is doing to my body. I've done some stuff to start stuff to my body and I'm starting to think about even though the money would be nice, but. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we start rationalizing. And yeah. the reason, that, I mean, you'd see that in SEAL training. Uh-huh. In SEAL training, you'd see someone say, you know, I don't know if, you know, I'm, I'm actually probably gonna get married and I don't know if it's the right thing to do to put my girlfriend through this. Yeah. And you're like, okay. Huh. Yeah, yeah, but for sure. Definitely don't wanna put your wife through this. Go quit. Yep. Go quit. That's so true. So it's so easy to rationalize things. Rationalization is the enemy. And that brings me back to where I started this, which was I'm not thinking about it because I know that my I know that my rationalization, my powers of rationalization can can win. Oh yeah. I can convince Powerful. myself 48 times. I just quoted a muscle and fitness magazine from 1987 that mm-hmm. said that the Bulgarians ensure that they get at least yeah. one complete day of rest for every five days of working out. Mm. You can support any crap that you want to support if you yep. just if you just want to rationalize with yourself. Yeah. Be irrational. Be irrational. Yeah. Well. Shut up. Do what you're supposed to do. Yeah, that uh, rationalizing is. I'm a very successful person in regards to rationalizing Everyone is. stuff. Oh, Everyone man. is. Yeah. You also know your own, you know what to say. Yeah. You know how to, com- yeah. like you're into being uh, healthy, right? And you're like, yeah, you know, I did see that. I did watch, just watch that YouTube video and they talked about the value of rest. It actually is oh, yeah. more important. <laughs> it's actually more important yep. than diet and lifting. The most important thing is rest. And I think I've been really, I don't think, I think, I think I actually, in order to truly have discipline, yep. I need to have the discipline just to not work out today. Yep. That's going to take discipline. <laughs> These are all lies. <laughs> They're all just lies. Yeah. They're all just rationalization. Yep. I, I like today, I was lifting today. Hell yeah. But I was rationalizing prior to lifting, I was rationalizing. I'm sitting there like observing myself, rationalizing. Yeah. Yeah. And what I had to do was actually, I, I was feeling a little tweak in my leg, mm. in my knee, no, no very minor. Mm-hmm. But I was like, well, you know, maybe a day, you know, just let that thing heal up, don't want it. And it's like, no, actually shut up. Yeah. And I, I lifted lighter, yeah. but I didn't rationalize. Yeah. I was like, okay, cool. But hurt leg, good. You know what's a good Let's stretch uh, it out. Calm thing to combat rationalizing and I well I'll just yeah, think, shut up and do what you're supposed to do that's one thing <laughs> yeah yeah well, um, yeah for sure but what I do or sometimes if I have the strength uh, is I'll imagine like you know how like I'll come with you with an issue like a, an excuse or something mm-hmm. and you always have some work around for the <laughs> excuse every single time like somewhere and it's like man if you can just imagine kind of what Jocko would say right now, you know, because you could legitimately have a tweak in your knee. You, yeah. you could. And in yeah. varying levels, it could be like almost like, hey, if you start doing this squat routine that you have planned, like you will make it worse. For sure. You know, but. You can also just use your other leg. Yeah. Right? Do some other stuff. Use pistols. Oh, yeah. You some know? other stuff. How that, about that? How's that sound? Oh, yeah. And a lot of times like that other stuff is like, man, I'd, I'd rather battle through the pain, to be honest. Okay. With you. So when you go surfing, sometimes. It's like cold, miserable. Maybe the waves aren't that great, but you know you should go. Yeah. So Stoner and I, we had this rule for a little while. When we got to our surf spot, we could either go surfing, or if you don't want to go surfing, that's fine, but now you have to swim around the pier. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah. like that's the deal. So guess what yeah. you do? You go surfing. And you know you should go surfing anyways. Even if you get two good waves, yeah. it's worth it. And you got to work out, you know, you got to paddle, but right. you're either going to, so you should have an alternative. Like, yeah. hey, you can either work out today or you can, whatever. Whatever some yeah. miserable thing is that sucks worse than working out. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'm going to come up with that thing. Yeah. So, and actually, I actually do that, but it's still working out. So it's like a version of that. It's it's a perfect, uh, uh, it's analogous to mm-hmm. your surfing thing. It's either do the workout plan yeah. or do this Metcon. And it's a specific Metcon. There's uh-huh. two of them. Uh-huh. If I did this one, the the last time I did Metcon, I'd do this other one. That's it. They're just two. So it's like either do the full workout or do the Metcon. Yeah. So if it's like, man, if you're if you think your knee is tweaked or whatever, you can do the Metcon. That's cool. Yeah, yeah do I the like Metcon. It. There you go. And it's like it's right on the borderline of the workout and the Metcon suck the same yep. equally. Yep. But you know how sometimes you're just not in the mood to to do that workout. Yeah. yeah. And then sometimes you're really not in the mood to do the Metcon. So. It's weird how sometimes you want to do, sometimes you would prefer to do a, a Metcon and sometimes you would prefer yeah. to lift heavy, yep. right? Yep. It's okay. Mm. It's okay. What's not okay is I don't feel like lifting heavy, so I'm just not going to do gonna anything. Do. Or I don't feel like yeah. doing a Metcon, so I'm just not going to do anything. Yeah, exactly. What you want to do, I like, I like that option. You can yeah. either do this or that. And I, I do that to a certain level. Mm. Uh, you know, if I, if I just... Whatever, I don't feel like doing anything that's going to be a Metcon scenario. I'm like, cool, I'm going to lift heavy, you yeah. know, uh, and I'm going to grind it out too. Yeah. It's not like I'm going to say, oh, well, I'm just going to, you know, yeah, no, I'm going to get some. That's why I like the Metcon because the Metcon is very specific. Mm-hmm. Like, you either did it or you just didn't do it correctly, mm-hmm. you know, kind of thing. Like, it has the, the rest in between each round. It's basically circuit training, yeah, essentially. And I got to do a certain weight, a certain amount of reps per thing. And so it's there. It's not like, oh, I'm going to go light or mm-hmm. I'm going to slack. It's kind of hard to slack because it's like it's real glaring if you do. So, yeah, you're choosing one or the other. I don't care what you're in the mood for or not in the mood for. Like, you got to do one, you mm-hmm. know. But if you, so I always have that in play always yeah and it works yeah it's good to give yourself a shitty alternative (laughs) (laughs) yes yes sir it is in these cases for sure yeah well anyway hopefully we are on the path whether you're working out every day or not i i'd say rec i recommend work out every day here's the thing if you're hurting yourself or something like that don't do that workout yeah yeah for sure don't do something that's going to injure you yeah but don't do nothing. Don't do nothing. Do a very deliberate yeah. workout every day. And, yes. the, and the point is there, too, is like that it after a while, it does just become normal. Yeah. Like just like making coffee or, ma- you know, like every day it's just, oh, that's sort of just what you do every single day. It's like, right, it becomes that, you know, and boom, you're a new person. Boom. Just like that. Just like that. Anyway, we're all on the path. We're working on it every, every day. Hey, look, your joints get sore. I get it. Mm-hmm. Right. Hey, my knees actually sore. Actually sore. I did squats super hard mm-hmm. the other day. You know the kind where mentally you go into like getting, <laughs> yeah, getting like two more reps or whatever yeah. in squats too. Yeah. And so mentally you kind of, it's almost like a, a, you turn off a certain part of your mind, you know? Yeah. So, and you're just, your body just has to like basically facilitate the rest. But then when you're done, when your mind switches back on, you're like f- just in pain. You know how you got to yeah, yeah, basically yeah, yeah. pay the price yeah. mentally afterwards. Yeah, yeah. You're you're on the road to recovery, which yeah. is cool. But anyway, it was one of those scenarios. And yeah, my knees were weird, strangely sore on the inside. Hmm. I don't know. Oddly, it's fully healed now, too, by the way. That was two days ago. Nonetheless, point is, sometimes <laughs> your joints get sore. Mine, too. Jocko's, too. When you get older, we're all getting older, I know, no matter how old you are. Nah. We're not getting older. No, but like everyone goes, oh, it's because you're getting older. No. Because you're no. not taking care. You're taking care less. Yeah. Most and also time. like when, when I was younger, you have sore. Yeah. It's not worse. Yeah. Mine's not really worse. I feel like my capacity, maybe my enthusiasm sometimes is less, but that might be just because I got more stuff going on as an adult. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Nonetheless, if your joints are sore, don't worry. Jocko has. When did you become you. an adult? How uh, old were you? Uh, I want to say like mid thirties. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was mid never to be honest with you, but I don't know. I think it's a slowly, slow, <laughs> we're gradual. Still, we're still heading there. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're working hard. Kids, yeah. kids, yeah. kids move that forward. When you have kids, you, yes. you start to become an adult pretty quickly. Yeah. 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 Certain elements. I mean, switch. Yeah, I mean you've got like humans that now there. rely on you yeah. for your food for their food yeah so kind of for everything like and even, everything else yeah like and roof just, yeah. yeah like and health health fucking development and guidance 
life, yeah. their whole freaking existence. Bunch of things we're talking about. Yeah, These so that can all, that can yeah. switch on the adult circuits yeah. for sure. For sure. How old's your How old's your oldest? Seven. Yeah. So I was probably right. Probably mid thirties. You started kind of moving in the direction of. Yeah, I think so too. Nonetheless, I don't have sore joints at the moment, <laughs> and that is because what I was trying to tell our everyone, the our people, people, our people. Jocko has supplementation called Jocko Fuel. The joint stuff is joint warfare. There is also super krill oil, which has other health benefits, by the way. But anyway, in combination, this will keep your joints in the game, working out seven days a week, working out five days a week, mm -hmm. whatever. Working out nine days a week. <laughs> nine days a week, all of that stuff. These will keep them together the whole time. You're going to be worried about your gains, not your joints. Dang, check him out. I'm just saying that these, these are Hey, factual. also vitamin D. Uh, now, we're in the midst of the pandemic, it's, and yep, everybody is saying take vitamin D. Thankfully, we make vitamin D. Yeah. Vitamin D3, get some of that. You can also get Cold War, which is immune health, which, again, these are products that we've had, and it's pretty cool that a lot of people are recommending them right now so you can stay healthy. Mm -hmm. And then on top of all this working out that you're doing, you're probably gonna need some, what Echo likes to call additional protein. Yes, additional. Well, because you know there's a, a, de a debate, if you will, depending on your lifestyle, of how much protein you should have. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So if you wanna supplement protein, I you recommend. You know how many people are listening to this right now? Uh, yeah, yeah, at this point, six. it's zero. Nah, you know, <laughs> there's <maybe> four six. people. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter because for those six people, they're guess gonna what? Hear they're going to hear fire. Yes, exactly. They're right. going to hear fire. <laughs> as far as fire goes, yes. Uh, Nonetheless, if you're going to supplement protein, you might as well have it in the form of dessert. That's yes. what Mulk is. I know, strange name. I get it. Nonetheless, supplement your protein like a dessert. Do it that way. We've got some kids protein too, warrior kid protein. Because why would you feed your kid something that's actual poison? You wouldn't do it. You'd get them warrior kid milk. They will love it. You will love that they're having it. They will be healthier, stronger, smarter, better. They're going to have a massive deadlift for sure. Oh, yeah. Just 100%. Yeah. Uh, white tea. We got that. And we also got these cans of what we call Discipline Go. Is it an energy drink? No, you know what? It is because it gives you energy, but it gives you real energy. Not a, not a lie. Not just a not just a massive hit of caffeine, 300 milligrams of caffeine. Look, you, you inject 300 milligrams of caffeine into a piece of wood, and it starts to get excited. <laughs> sure. But yeah, after a little while, wood. it's like very quickly, it's back to just being wood. You put a bunch of sugar yeah. into, a, into a rat, and it gets all excited. Yeah. That's fake energy. Yeah, man. This is real energy. It's got, it's not got no sugar in it, but it still tastes good. It's sweet with monk food. Blah blah blah. blah. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. The blah blah. And, and I get it. I I understand why you said blah 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 because it's like yeah, these are all these numbers and all this stuff or whatever. But man, I kind of looked into it. I did look into mm -hmm. it, by the way. And so so preservatives, sweeteners, like these things. That these are the things that make normal. Energy drinks, yeah, bad for you. Yeah, d well, yeah, the ones that are bad for you. And you know, there's a bunch of energy drinks, so I can't. Use, so it's hard to for me in the spirit of accuracy to say, oh, all energy drinks or all this or all that. But the preservatives and artificial sweeteners are are straight up poison, straight up. Mm -hmm. But they do sweeten or they do preserve or do you know? And there's this these list of very specific things that they put in. The only reason they're in there is not to help you. Yeah, it's to help the drink. <laughs> it helps stay the drink. on the thing yes. or help so, it. And what Echo trying to say is, we don't have any of those there things in here. Not that. In order to not put chemicals in there to preserve it, we pasteurize it yep. like what you do with milk. Yes. So, and in order to sweeten it, we've only got monk fruit, which is good for you. Yep. Monk fruit is good for you. Yeah. So, anyways, all these different items, uh, you can get it. You can get originmain.com. You can also. Get them at the vitamin shop, and we're a little, we're about to enter a new market in the world. You know when people say, oh, I really wish this stuff was available here or there. Man. We're moving in that direction. It's starting, started with vitamin shop. Next thing we're going into is a place called Wawa, which is a convenience store 
mostly East Coast. We're starting in Florida and Virginia. If you live in those areas, be on the lookout because you'll be able to walk into a Wawa and clean out the shelf. (laughs) Clean out the shelf, get yourself some discipline, go try the different flavors. And yeah, you'll get that little, you'll get that little mid morning. Hitter. Yeah. And that, that you know, thinking and you won't get a post drink crash where you're like, Ugh. yeah, no, yeah, and and being in the in the store mm-hmm. is like especially like a convenience store scenario, whatever. It's yeah. it makes it it does. It, this is a big deal in this sense where right now, and I get it. Like you you, you order your shipment, mm-hmm. you know, you get it whether it be online or whatever, um, or find a vitamin shop for sure. Mm-hmm. But when it's when it's at the store, you can just sort of stop in and get one kind of thing yeah. on the way here, on the way there, whatever. It makes it a whole different process. Yeah. Way more convenient, if you were. Probably why they call it convenience stores, by the way. Yeah. Unless yeah. that's a good that's good news right there. Uh, yeah, so Discipline Go mm-hmm. is what it's called in the can. I don't know if you mentioned that for those who yeah. may not have known that. Got it. Thank you. So anyway, yes. Uh, or OriginMain.com. Yep. You can get it there. That's also, the other stuff at OriginMain is... Jiu-Jitsu gis. If you don't have one, get one from there. American made, all well, good. What are we doing without a Jiu-Jitsu gi at this point? I, I have no idea. We should definitely be having a Jiu-Jitsu gi. Yes, that's, sir. That's for sure. Also, jeans, American denim. Also, some hoodies, some other clothing items on there. American made boots, works mm-hmm. of art. I've heard them be referred to as <laughs> works of art made in America. Oh, you just made Pete Roberts that's and right. so happy. Yeah, well, it's accurate. I agree with the statement. It's real good. Yeah, they are. This is works of art and also the preservation of a culture of creation and manufacturing. Yeah, that, yeah, That's what's happening. Kind of, kind of this is that. a lost, sure. this is a dying art, mm-hmm. a dying capability that is now being preserved. Whether it's the, the manufacturing of the cloth to make the geese, whether it's the manufacturing of the boots, whether it's the, the, the sewing and fabrication of the jeans, all of it is a preservation of a manufacturing a manufacturing thread that ties America together. So we're not gonna let it die, by the way, and we appreciate you all helping us keep it alive. So yes, originmain.com. So we can get this stuff. Also, Jocko has a store. JockoStore.com. I just made like kind of a of a statement, and then you go, yeah, so you know, that's where you can get this stuff. But it's true. Okay. There you go. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You, want, uh, you can you get go. these pieces of art. You started oh, yeah. it. Man, that was so freaking deep, bro. It was deep. <laughs> and man, thank you so much for, for, for saying that. You're welcome. Jocko. You're welcome. Anyway, Jocko I'm glad that my services have been <laughs> fully appreciated. How epic my speech was. <laughs> yes, sir. It was. Jockostore.com. Wow. We we can get our shirts. This one equals freedom. Def core to the core. By the way, good. Good. Get out all these shirts. You if you want to represent while you're on the path. Jockostore.com. Back to the book. Back to the book all day. That's a shirt. Oh yeah. Also hoodies on there. Some tank tops. Other, other items. So we're adding, we got a hardcore recondos on there. Back in stock, by the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of David, and we didn't even get to this part of About Face. Well, but I think we all know the, 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 the what do you call the legend or the, what do you call it? When everyone sort of, the canon. Is that what it's called? The canon is like a big book or a big work of art. I mean, a big it's work of writing. The, the part of the story that's like, you know, they became the, the crux of the story, perhaps. No, it's a, it's like legendary, a legendary kind the of part iconic of the story. part of the story. Like one of them, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, why they're called call, called the hardcore rather than the hopeless? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Hopeless. Anyway, hardcore recondos. Yes, sir. No slack. Um. Yes. So we got that shirt. We got we got some cool stuff. Continuously adding items on there. Maybe like once a month. Month once every two months. Maybe. So anyway, check in there if you like. We do have an email list if you want to get emailed. Dang. For new stuff, um, basically just new stuff. That's it, pretty much. Warrior Kid Soap's on there too. Yes, sir. Which is legit. Yes, that's all we use now. And here's <laughs> it, here. You know what's weird? The um, the compliments that I hear personally and online is that it smells real good. There you go. 
it, it doesn't seem like that was like one of the things that were or that Aiden and them were like trying to like push. Like, just hey, a byproduct of excellence. Just <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. And that is the case for the, sure. Yes, we're and but even though it smells good, which I agree with, but even more important, it can help you, it can help your family. Stay clean. <laughs> Stay clean. <laughs> subscribe Seriously. to the podcast. Don't just subscribe to this podcast. We got some other podcasts. We got the Jocko Unraveling podcast. We got the Grounded podcast. We got the Warrior Kid podcast. We got a YouTube channel. If you want to see Echo's YouTube uh, uh, videos that he makes, where he makes everything s- explode and blow up and so, catch on fire. Sometimes. Except if okay. it's a long video, in which case he'll just let you be bored with that, which he's Not fine boring. with. It's we got boring. an album called Psychological Warfare which is me talking about moments of weakness that that we may need to overcome. You might need a little help overcoming that. When you're you, trying to rationalize. You might be trying to rationalize. We can fight through that together. Press play. You press play. You have it on there. You have a little MP3 on there. Mm-hmm. You press play on your phone. That's true. And then all of a sudden, you stop rationalizing and you start doing. Yep. Uh, flip side canvas. If you want to not rationalize visually, Get yourself some get yourself some things to represent. I know that Leif just told me that he hooked up the Echelon Front HQ building in Texas with some flip side canvas works for the walls. Uh, we also have some books. Hey, first of all, this book right here, About Face, written by Colonel David Hackworth. I wrote the forward, won an honor, check it out. This is a book you can refer back to forever. I'm still reading it. I have been reading this book for approximately, I would say approximately 20 years. Approximately 20 years, and I'm still reading it. We also have the code, the evaluation, the protocol, written by myself, Dave Burke, Sarah Armstrong, in the mix on that one. Leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual. All the answers are in there. (laughs) All the answers are in there. They really are. Get that book. You can look up. Oh, you got a problem with your employees acting a certain way? Cool. Go to Leadership Strategy. Oh, your boss, you're having a hard time leading up the chain? Cool. Go in there. Check it out. Oh, your morale's down for your troops? Okay, go in there. Check it out. All the answers are in there. Leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual. We got Way of the Warrior Kid. One, two, three. We got four on the way. Be checking out for it. We'll have it to pre-order as ASAP. It's uh, it's it's the final version is with the printers at this time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're right. there. Yeah. We also want to know. You know, sometimes we collectively cause shortages of certain books. <laughs> so if you want to get Way the Warrior Kid Four, please pre-order it so that you don't get caught at Christmas time with no book for your little warrior kid. Don't forget about Mikey and the Dragons. Speaking of warrior kids, don't forget about the Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. There is a new edition out. The new edition. I wrote a bunch more for it. We added it in there. It's got a new cover. It's got a, a photograph by Echo Charles on the cover. The photograph is of my head. Yep. Which we, which you took of me? Yes. You think that there was there a big like setting up of the lighting and all this stuff? No. Yeah. I was standing in Echo Charles's hallway. We just got done recording the podcast in his living room, and he goes, "Hold on a second, turn around." And he's holding a camera, and he goes, "Click, click." Yeah. And one of those two shots yeah. is Echo's iconic picture that is on the cover. It's bigger. Have I shown you the new one yet? I have one. You I have, have the. It's not a completed one. It's actually blank, oh, you have a fake one on the inside. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I have the cover. Have I'll the bring cover. you the real one. Yeah, I'll bring you the real one. So they made it look a little bit more. And you know, I'm I'm an old school hardcore kid from back in the day, and so things had a certain look to them. Uh-huh. And this one kind of moved in that direction a little yeah. bit, being a little bit like my old school hardcore days DIY, yeah. make things happen. You got a good track record with covers, I guess. Say yeah, like yeah, they look solid. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. So there's all those books. Plus, there's extreme ownership. Plus, there's the dichotomy of leadership, which I wrote with my brother, Leif Babin. We have Echelon Front, which is a leadership consultancy. We solve problems through leadership. That's what we do. Go to echelonfront.com if you need help in your business. We have EF Online, where we are providing 
leadership instruction through an online platform, answering questions. There's a for, there's all kinds of things to do on there. There's courses to take. There is EF Overwatch, where we are taking people from the military and putting them into civilian companies in leadership positions, people that understand the principles that we talk about here. And finally, if you want to help, if you want to help out our military members, active members, retired members, their families, gold star families, if you want to support, then check out Mark Lee's mom. That's Mark Lee from Tasking to Bruiser, his mom, Mama Lee. She has a charity organization. If you want to donate or you want to get involved, go to America's Mighty Warriors.org. And if you if you feel the need, if you just feel the need to hear more of my unbearable bellowing, or you maybe you just need a little hitter, a little dose of Echo's muddled meanderings, which we certainly got plenty of today. You can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, on Instagram, which Echo just so he knows what I'm talking about, he refers to Instagram as the Gram. Mm-hmm. Facebook, Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And thanks once again to my mentor, Colonel David Hackworth, for everything he did for me, for his soldiers, for the Army, and for America. And thanks to all the military personnel out there right now right now, right at this moment, while you're sitting there listening to this podcast, while we're sitting here making this podcast, there are military personnel out there right now holding the line against evil and protecting our way of life. And the same thing to police and law enforcement and firefighters and paramedics and EMTs and dispatchers and correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, all other first responders, thank you for holding the line and protecting us here at home and everyone else out there you know we have to remember that in life most of the time we don't have the luxury we don't have the luxury of a colonel or a captain or a lieutenant or a sergeant hackworth in our lives We don't have someone there to keep us in line, to make us do push-ups and give us a good, swift kick in the ass when we slack off. What we have to do is we have to be our own Sergeant Hackworth. We have to be our own Mr. Infantry. We have to be our own hardcore Rakondo to hold the highest standards and allow no fucking slack that is our charge as leaders as people as human beings so go out there and get after it until next time this is echo and jocko out